and it's gotta leave. But you, you different, you shine and you glisten. Let me stop and listen. Oh, they're on! They jump right in his head! They found who they need! That's a big shot down! He oh, hooks himself Lord. back in! They want it! Because oh. they thought here, but what was that? It's a pentacle! They go one for one with the shirt. Fire gets slammed into the wall to actually go to Olaf. There's the access shot! And he just come up with it! Good evening, all you gorgeous LCO fans, and welcome to week three, day one. We're kicking off your Monday in fine fashion because I've got a fine gentleman next to me. I've got Poltron joining me here as our as our guest. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you got our two stock standard men there, Skimmy and Max Myers. How are you both over there on the couch? We're good. I'm glad that Max is on my couch again. You know, yep. I feel like he's elevated his, uh, his casting career a whole bunch since shifting from that side to this side. It's the only gone from better it's, to worse. It's night and day, really. It. And this, it's an honor to be able to sit on this couch for the period that Rusty's away. And how much of an honor is it to sit next to me, Poltron? Look, <laughs> Matt, it's great yeah. sitting next to you. Oh, you're not Mac, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, look, that's fair, that's fair. I'm trying my best, the mustache, and no, I've been trying for 26 years now. Still not really Keep on trying, through. it'll grow yeah. eventually. Yeah, eventually, You'll get surely, there. surely, Copium. Uh, but look, if you guys are only just tuning in, it is week three, and if you're wondering what happened on our last day of LCO in week two, day two on Wednesday, then I've got a nice little recap for you. Trying to pick in the top lane, it's not Whoa. the case! What a hook! Getting fighter, that's the target you need. In jumps by who he's got the afterlife speed flashes on their heads and gives them a bouncy castle. Triple kill, make it a quadra. Might be a great screen in this second as Bio walks in and says, Here, have an absolutely beautiful explosive cast. Two man on top Heavy. of the opposition. And is that enough yeah. to prevent Kanga from falling on down? I don't think it is. Shinky dead, sent to the afterlife. Heavy jumps in and says, This is what I can do. This is the depth that this Chief Crosser has. Will that be the factor? Will that be the difference? In jumps in, but finds the charm onto Gwen. Instant headbutt coming out here from the Maokai. Looking to try and lock him down with Tron. In jumps Bulldog. Looking to try and take this back line down. But it receives the wild growth. He gets charmed. He cleanses out. He gets shredded. He's gone. In this found two. He starts it off. He finishes it off. As there he bursts on down. And they claim an ace. Yeah, this fly is very low. Yeah, it's the old way to safety. If they are the ones who are going to try and be strong, but it's not enough when they actually bait them all in. Tron says, I can try and do it all on my own right now. Isolates out Doggy, but Doggy can run away. Forces out the flash. Tron now separates oh. from the team. Unstoppable force on their head. And what can you do? Tron has literally gone the other side of the map to realize that his team is dead without him. And inside his own base, Pensnet say, you're not surviving. But he says, hey, there's we got our standings here because we've already had quite a few days of LCO now. It does mean that our Chiefs, when they get the 2-0 in this new best of two format, they pick themselves up two times three, which is nice, quick, easy maths, max six, six points for themselves. Then it is Bliss, <laughs> Tiles. Oh, you're the one that's in uni, you know? I've got to fact check my maths with you. Well, you did engineering, so I think you're probably a bit more qualified than me. <laughs> but I think what's you there. He does kind of have me there. Yeah. What's interesting, taking a look at the standings, right, is if you consider that one single 2-0 is three points, that's almost the distance between basically our tied sixth team and our first team. So obviously, Chiefs are sitting pretty at the top with six mm. points, but it's so variable in terms of having one off week and having a bad performance can really shake it up how we're looking. But obviously, Chiefs you know, sitting where they want to be at the start. Yeah, and I mean, it, look, it's double third place that Dire Wolves, Poltron, you guys got yourselves three points. Yeah, getting the win, you know, three whole, uh, the three whole points, yeah. yeah. I'm forgetting, you know, I'm a coach in the LCO. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll refresh your memory. You gotta refresh you guys, my memory. Yeah, you guys lost in week one. Uh, yeah, yeah you got you. got got 0-2'd You know, I, I actually played week one, <laughs> and then we got 0 2 so great, you know, great just, ending into yeah. my 2023 <laughs> playing career, back to coaching. First week back coaching my team 2-0, three points. Yeah, I, look, it is a great uh, bounce back for you, but obviously mm -hmm. what Max was also touching on is just how close everyone is below that. We've got three teams on two points themselves. Kanga having a draw, give themselves one point, and unfortunately Vertex, they still haven't even got a draw on the board for themselves, so with a double loss skim, it is uh, zero points for them. 
It is, but they've got a really good shot tonight up against Kangaroo Esports with a roster that looks to be fully completed now. So probably their best chance of showing what their full potential looks like with uh, a few good weeks um, to really get yourself familiar with what the competitive landscape looks like compared to what Solo Q and Amateur um, has certainly offered. Kango will be coming into this one. I don't know if you'd say they're the favorites, but they have obviously had the uh, experience of a prior split to, to get to terms of everything. So I feel like this one should certainly really deliver um, as a fair indication as to where Verdicts really could stand on the standings, whether it not be, you know, in my case, you know, last place of some of the others on the couch here, um, a little bit higher up. And after that, then you've got Mammoth up against the Chiefs. Chiefs getting their first real test. Um, off the split, as for Mammoth, the team that have really been a bit of a dark horse, right? Sitting in a fourth position up against two really strong teams, come away with two draws, uh, potentially have the, uh, the ability to force another. It's interesting whenever people say, you know, Mammoth, they're coming away with two draws, it's looking great for themselves. This Orc has definitely had a bit of a tumultuous past, definitely not living up to expectations, but out of those two series, Poltron, do you think the Mammoth Chiefs is going to be the closest, or could it potentially be the Vertex Kanga? Well, I think Mammoth have already showcased a lot. Obviously, they took one game off both Bliss and Pantanet, but I think tonight, Vertex and Kanga will be the closest series. Mm -hmm. Okay, could be the closest. Is it going to be the most entertaining though, Max? No, I think <laughs> Mammoth, Mammoth Chiefs, certainly two teams are buying for the top of the standings. I think looking at the Vertex uh, Kanga game, it's a must win, in my opinion, for a team like Vertex. Obviously, Skimmy mentioned they didn't have their full rosters heading into the first two weeks. Now that they do, they really need to start getting some points on the board. Yeah, especially because, what, now with playoffs in this format, it's going to be six teams going to playoffs. So it's nice. It does mean, though, unfortunately, there are only going to be two teams that don't make it to playoffs. And you at least want to put yourself in contention that you're going to be having to have a look at head-to-heads. It's going to be like some form of tiebreak is like a way to try and split this. So... Uh, it would be nice to get at least a point on the board for themselves. See, the LC would be a little bit closer, even though it's already pretty close for themselves. But in the two weeks that we've already had, Skim, there's been some very standout champions. There certainly have been. Uh, some of the stats that we pulled up going into uh, this third week of gameplay is the fact that our three most played champions uh, are actually all bot lane. So you've got Aphelios, you've got Jinx, uh, as well as Nautilus all rounding out. Nobody's even close to those champions. The one thing that stands out in particular for that would be that 82% win rate here for the Jinx. So it just shows that a lot of teams are building their comps around the, uh, the ability to try and reset. We've seen a lot of Viego, a lot of Sandra as well, double reset compositions at times. Um, and just looking to try and really dictate the pace of a team fight so you snowball out of control. One thing to note, obviously on the right-hand side then, is that Presence is 100% here for Nico. Every single time it's been played, it's won. It's just unbelievable the amount of priority wow. you get. The ability to cause confusion with your shape shifting. Um, has been second to none. Then when you look at Gragas, another flex champion that can be played in multiple uh, lanes at this point, basically four, um, you look at the, the win rate in the top lane, uh, undefeated, 100%, right? It's been such a good champion. Uh, and for the teams that have the ability to flex it quite handily between their um, top and mid lane, then it's been the go-to. The last one, obviously, that stands out for me is the fact that Milio is still a 100% ban rate. Other regions in the world are just making trades. Yep, you can have that champion. This is our response to it. Elsio seems to be a little bit concerned about it. I think we have been very uh, risk adverse when it's come to enchanters in general, but obviously we've yet to see really the, the, the true power mm. of what the latest champion has to offer. And look, this is the absolute magic of having a coach on the couch here is Paulton, you're going to deep dive a little bit more because I want to know why it is that the Jinx keeps coming up so consistently. Same with Aphelios here. What is it about those two specifically? Is it more comfort or are you like, they really do just feel broken in trying to craft a, a team comp? Well, I think the first thing to look about or to talk about is Jinx, right? I look at Jinx and I think, okay, we're playing an Oath. We love team fighting. Jinx is probably one of the best team fighting 80 carries right now besides Zeri. Uh, obviously, Zeri gets banned a fair bit. I think when you look at the Aphelios, okay, it's high execution, right? Mm -hmm. If you actually do play well, get it off nice, the win rate will start going up, but it's not looking good right now. 36% win rate, 11 games. I think Praetith played it a couple times, won both games on it, but hey. I think that should go up a bit over the split, and the yeah. Jinx win rate should probably go down a little bit. But look, if you're drafting an Ose, if you're a coach, if you're a player, lock Jinx, all right? Lock <laughs> Jinx, that's the cheat sheet. Go team fight, forget about lane. Every game is going to randomly come mid, 5v5. Yeah, it's, it's going to end up being a little bit of an A round. What's up, Max? This is basically the standard trade that's been happened ever since Aphelios came out. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like Aphelios Jinx, if you're an AD carry, has been the matchup you've learned for basically your entire career yep. in the LCO, right? I think mm -hmm. with to your point of Zeri being banned a lot, yeah. the whole not, Enchanter's not wanting to be played. 
for example, internationally, we're seeing a lot of Milio and Yumi trades in the bot lane. That's not something we do in this region, right? Mm. Milio, as we can see, has literally not gone through the ban phase a single time. So that really reduces the pool of available champions to really, you're saying, okay, we're going to handshake this Jinx and Aphelios. Which I suppose then becomes a byproduct. That's why we're not seeing Lucian in this region as well, because you need an enchanter to pair alongside it for the passive to make that damage actually worthwhile. If we're not playing Anami or any of these other enchanters, then Lucian's just going to fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. Doesn't also then talk about why we're seeing Nort picked up so much more as well. I think he's also been picked up quite a lot in other regions too, Poltron. I think Nort's probably the most reliable, line pickable, engaged support right now. Um, to touch on the Milia really quick, I don't think Milia is, you know, this super OP champ. It is very strong. But if you look at other regions, they open it, right? They open the Milio, trade it for Yumi or pick Nort Blitz into it. But so far in the Oceanic region, here in the LCO, we have not seen you uh, not seen the milio. Are you gonna have the confidence on the on dials to maybe let through the milio or pick it up yourselves if it gets let through? Look, I'm not leaking any <laughs> draft tactics, right? I'm gonna try. The whole day is just gonna be poked <laughs> and trying to get some strats out of Paul Look, you'll eventually get something out of me, but tomorrow dials do play the Pentanet team and Pentanet are very good. Well, I'm not not saying a word about that though. I'm not saying a word. Lip sealed. sealed. Lip sealed. Lip sealed. I, I do want to. Uh, Poke and prod a little bit more. I want to know like how it is coaching. I want to know a little bit more about your team, mm -hmm. what you sort of bring to the table a bit more as, as a coach too, and how your coaching career has gone for you. Well, initially I started out in the LCO as a coach. It was great. Coach for I think a year and a half, then got thrown at the deep end because our jungler moved to another team, started playing, it was fun, did pretty well. Played again in the first split this year, did decently well. First place in the regular season, third in the playoffs. Unfortunately, didn't make the top two. But coming into split two, I wasn't actually too sure what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But because we had lost our coach for other reasons, we didn't have a coach lined up. And I just told management, hey, I've coached before, you know me. Moving back to coach, I'll sign a jungler who I think is good and I can work with. Obviously, now we have Sharka. And the one big thing, besides the actual coaching and you know knowing the team and bring them all together, is I can speak Mandarin. That's good. That, that's Shaka. actually pretty goaded. Yeah, you're like, I, I get to be this in-between of yeah. everyone now. So I'm the coach, <laughs> translator. You know, I'm doing everything in terms of, hey, Shark, our bot gets pushed here, right? You can play the bot, look for the invade, or, okay, our team wants to play for the Rift. How do we communicate that, right? I think in our scrims so far and a couple of our stage games, all right, Shark may have been a little bit off the mark with mm -hmm. what our team wanted to do, but that, that is my job, right? Yeah. I need to prep that dumb it down as much as possible, make sure the English is very understandable for him. Yeah. How much uh, time split would you say is done between replay, working with players individually, or you don't really do that too much and it's very much the, the team always doing stuff together? Ooh, I think for some of the players, I definitely do work with them individually. Uh, for example, Praetith and Decoy in the bot lane. I spend time with them a few days a week going over the raw 2v2 bot lane stuff, right? And again, they're very good players. They probably know the lane better than I do. Mm -hmm. I'm not there to teach them. I'm just there to make sure, hey, are you thinking about this? Are you thinking about that? And then we come to the conclusion, all right, is this matchup actually good? Or do we play it, you know, do we play it well? Enemy team played it poorly or the vice versa, right? So I want to have consistent matchups in my mind. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll pick this in scrims, pick it on game day. Here's how the priority works. How do we path, right? Does my jungle want to come? Path down bot. We need to cover the dive, whatever it is. This is all crucial stuff. Cool. I definitely could never be a coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot to it. And, and the only real question I had was, how have you found the, the sort of transition between switching between, you know, coach, player, coach, player? I think any other person that really springs to mind would be somebody like Babbitt. I mean, yeah. is, is there a world in which, you know, when you play and you show that the players, hey, like, these hands still work, I can still play at this level. So when you go back into a coaching position, it's like, it commands a bit more authority, respect, because they know that you're, you're that level? Oh, for sure. I think all of my players respect me because again i've been where they are mm. i've played before i've played to a you know a high level i wouldn't say to the top level because i've never won and that's something that hopefully i can do as a coach this split but yeah it is different having the background of actually playing the team the team inherently just i can feel them trusting more and me more because sure. i've been there they're like oh hey i'm stressed you know i'm not confident in this draft or we just lost game one but we have another game here how do i bounce back mm. And um, yeah, in terms of the actual mechanics, I don't think my mechanics were ever the main reason why I was a decent player, but hey, I stole a lot of the Barons. <laughs> I stole a lot of Barons of Straw One. Don't flip it against me. You'll always win that coin toss over yeah. there. Uh, but look, I appreciate you giving us a little bit of insight on champs, but also the coach, how Direwolves are going. But 
it's not just us that get to have a say on this broadcast. That's right, you guys from the fans also get to have a little bit of a say. If you want to answer our question, then you can tweet at us using the hashtag LCO. And this time around, today we've asked you guys which champion you would like to see more of in pro play. And we've got some answers already lined up. Some people have already told us, so let's get one of them. Nico, if only she'd stop getting banned. <laughs> I don't know what games this person's been watching. We just saw the stats of how good Nico is. She's come up, what, five times? 100% win rate. That's yeah. a free win. It's just insanely broken. I don't know if anyone watched LEC today, but Caps had an absolute blinder performance on Nico. Solo lost his team the game multiple times <laughs> by pretending to be a control ward and then looking for a five-man ulti. And I think that's why Nico is so fun to watch, mm. because she can do so many quirky things that you don't get to see with any other champion. That being said, it's not always uh, productive to your team winning the game. Yeah, do you guys have any, very quickly, very emotional, personal-driven Champs that you want to see? I want to see more Kaiser. I kind of enjoy the whole champion that you are evolving your abilities through more stat gain. It's a flashy champion for me, right? The killer instinct to try and jump into the back line. You either sort of 1v9 or, or look like a, a one for one <laughs> bit of a clown. So um, I always sort of enjoy that high execution. Speaking about the clown, I want to see Shaco. <laughs> I know, Gooby, you're watching this. I know you're there. Lock Shaco. <laughs> I think I've been sort of edging him. Hey, hey, pick Shaco. Pick Shaker with Rakan. Good win, you know? It's definitely one win. Yeah, you pass the torch on to him yeah, now. Yeah, pass the torch on. You yeah. know, I played three games of Shaker, somehow won them all. Looking back at it, I don't know if it was actually uh, wise to do that, but... Hey, you had fun. A win. I had fun. And a win is a win. Let's I see had a lot of fun. what another fan has to say for what champ they'd like to see. Oh. Who's this guy? <laughs> Who is he? Get him off my screen. I don't want him. Bard, 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 I'm going to report bard. the main game for spam. Good. <laughs> Muted. On Twitter too. Spam. Banned. Report it. Gone. I, I could never have predicted Rusty would have said Bard at all. Never. No. I don't think it's a good competitive champion, though. It's fun, but when your AD carry is having to play with a Bard, it's not the best experience for them. And given how AD carries start, kind of run this league and they're kind of the presidents, it's not a very good experience for you them. You just pick whatever they say. You're like, okay, That's exactly sounds right. good. I'll do that for you. Uh, let's jump into this matchup, though, because we've heard from our fans. We've heard from us a lot. But we get to talk a little bit more about Vertex. They're going to be coming up against Kenga today. So this Vertex team haven't yet guarded themselves. Even a game win, unfortunately, Skim. No, they haven't. But this is why I got excited, because Dante's been announced as the new starting AD carry. This is something that we were excited for, because it now shows you this is their full roster, their five man going forward. Uh, and what it could really look like, right? So the thing that stands out the most for me is the fact that Chirp has, even despite their losses, really been putting on a bit of a clinic in terms of his uh, DPS output. I think it's, you know, 33% on average of the team's share. So you know that there's a lot of hype behind him for a good reason too. Just needs a bit more agency, I suppose, um, linking up with his jungler. But then, you know, the, the reliability of an AD carry that's not even an autofill, your coach subbing in to then give you sort of that late game insurance. So I'm curious to see um, how this shakes it up. I think Dante will have a great mentor and Rosie there to back him up to help him grow and, and sort of showcase what he can do on a personal level to close out the entirety of this year. But like, uh, like Max already mentioned, you know, this is that game, a, a bit of a must win. Yeah, and I think that the Dante addition is huge on multiple levels. One, you're obviously not playing with your coach or an autofill, right? That's fantastic. But two, to me, when you look at a player like Chirp, right, he has had a lot of pressure placed on him to sort of deliver. He's a rookie, but he's got all of this pressure on this Vertex, this new team coming into the league to really be that star player. When you've got someone like Dante on the team, he's proven that he can carry games on his own. That sort of takes a bit of that off. It means that he doesn't always have to feel that he has to 1v9 the game or else it's lost. It really helps ease up and probably going to help him play a bit better as well. Okay, well hopefully then we're going to see Vertex as a roster come together, have a little bit more cohesion. But like I said before, they're going to be coming up against Kanga, Holtrin. Mm. And uh, for you, how would you sort of describe this team? They've been able to pick up a few, at least one game win for themselves. It was a grand, against Ground Zero uh, back in week one. But now that we've seen a couple times from them, how would you describe them? Well, Kang is a bit of an interesting team, right? They've still got the same jungle mid from Split 1. The core identity of those two still there. Shinky in the top lane. Very unexpected role swap. Not sure how he will be, you know, doing long term. Uh, Voice and Jake, brand new bot, popping in. So far, it's been a bit shaky. I think, um, I honestly don't know. It is rough, or it's tough to make the comparison between both them and Vertex, right? Mm -hmm. Like Vertex have Dante, great AD carry player, finally have their main roster. Would you, which lane do you think is the strongest for Kanga? How would you want to, if you were their coach, you'd be like, okay, maybe this is the strongest lane you guys should be focusing on. Oh, mid jungle on. for sure. Okay. Uh, if Kanga want to go 2-0, you play through Fido, right? Okay. May yeah. plays with Fido, play together, make sure you're getting Fido ahead. Snowball through mid, impact bot after, 
That's how you win. 100%. I think if you give Mei Fan a champion like, you know, Yavai, Wukong, Viego, any kind of champion that he gets to either excel mechanically or just have a, a whole bunch of impact in terms of engage potential, fuels the fire for Faker Fido to try and 1v9 the game on all those hyper late game scaling, you know, AP mages. Yep. Anything you want to add about the Kengo roster over there, Max? I think. Well, shout out Shinky one first of all for tripling his champion pool. Oh, uh, he went from one to three. Yep, massive big improvement there. I think he's actually shown that he can. Now he's played an enchanter, a carry, and a tank, right? So mm -hmm. he's no longer as one-dimensional in draft. You're not going in thinking, okay, hey, he's just going to pick Karma. It's not one versus twenty-five in the champion pool anymore. Exactly, <laughs> it's three versus twenty-five now. So <laughs> he's definitely got but a bit more. It was also the the difference in the champs that he picked as well. I think. Yeah. So it's not just doubling; it's the difference in what we're. Yeah, getting exactly, and that's that's sort of the point that I wanted to raise was that there is that. A, a, a extra level of versatility there, right? So you can't just say, okay, we're going to blind pick in Aurelia because we know he's going to pick Karma. Mm. So I think that really helps and, you know, have that stable top, allow Kanga to play through mm -hmm. Fido and hope you get the win that way. Yeah. You guys briefly touched on that change up over on Vertex roster. Dante now coming in and uh, look, luckily for us and the viewers, we've got Dante for an interview. Dante, hey, how are you going? How does it feel to be uh, on Vertex starting and having your first game for Split 2 today? Feels good, it feels good. Uh, hi, Polchon, by the way. Looking good. Thank you, Dante. Um, <laughs> you guys, you guys want to take uh, this one? Yeah. I'll, I'll oh, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, okay. How you doing, man? You looking good in your new jersey. <laughs> Thank you. Feeling Vertex. good? Vertex. Shout out Zoe. Oh, wait, wrong. So... <laughs> You're shouting out the logo. Yeah. All good. Shout out Vertex. So... Yes, sir. New team. First week mm -hmm. back. You pumped? You ready? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it was quite unfortunate that like I couldn't play the first few weeks because mm -hmm. you know LCO regulations. But um, yeah, now I'm feeling good, really ready to play. So you're against Voice and Jake in the bot lane. How do you think that matchup's gonna go? Mm -hmm. Oh, they're quite the fearsome duo. Quite <laughs> nah, nah, nah. the fearsome duo. Uh, I think. You're shaking? I think. At least in scrims, mm -hmm. I'd say they're like probably the easiest team. I mean, Ooh. only duo I've had to verse, so I think it should be smooth sailing. Uh, speaking of scrims, even though you haven't been on the starting roster or you haven't played in the LCO mm -hmm. officials, have you guys been scrimming as this full five uh, man for the last few weeks or just recently? Like, how has that been going? Yeah. So, even though I haven't been playing, I've still been scrimming, like, I'd say last two weeks. Okay. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to add, Paul John? One last thing. How does it feel leaving Bulldog in the dust back on Ground Zero? <laughs> Played with him two splits, Look. won some dives with us, with me, of course, <laughs> then on Ground Zero, and now, oh, you've just dipped. You're like, hey, Rosie, let's play together. Rosie's my goat. Rosie's exactly. my goat. Rosie's Bulldog's, your goat. Bulldog's left in the dust, that's all I'm going to say. Don't worry about him. He's gone. <laughs> Sorry, Jay. <laughs> oh, look, it, it happens. Thank you so much for joining us, though, Dante, and uh, good luck today. Thank you, thank you. I thought he was going to end up spitting some bars. You know, Rosie's my goat, <laughs> Bulldog's the dog. It's not everything. I love Bulldog's these, the um, dog. <laughs> these AD carry interviews. They're always spicy. They always like set a premise like, oh, this is going to be so free of a matchup. And then you're like, oh, I hope this doesn't age poorly. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The confidence going in is, is yes, super high. Dude, I think, yes. I think Violet's another one, right? Who has yeah. Oh, yeah. mega confidence going in. That has some I good love it. Nuke dropped on his head last week as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah I think, who was it? Ico? Yeah. Who Ico. went like 12 and 0 or something on the Zerian yeah, game. 14 right? and 0. 14 yeah. and 0, there you go. Yeah, I like it though. I do like the confidence. One, I think just gen generally, mm -hmm. when you're playing competitively, to have that confidence you need. But two, it makes it good for us. And now that it's a best yeah. of two, it can go, it can split, right? It's spicy. Yeah, you can back up what you're saying. And all the time, you might get turned around and just absolutely just like Thumbs slapped. Out. Yeah. So, you never know what's going to come out from either team, but I do like it. Dante obviously talking about that they've been scrimming, so it's not just going to be jumping in there, mm -hmm. unsure, um, you know, what is really going on, and obviously he would have been watching as well. I don't expect him to sort of uh, confine to the matter of what is, you know, these drinks of Filiosis and all the rest. I will say that his, uh, Ezreal is like one of his most played, and, you know, Ezreal is one of those champions just on the fringe, I think, of being able to be played. Obviously, you are going to prefer those hyper carries, as you already mentioned, but yeah, I feel the like jinx especially. there's definitely a world in which, you know, you could say, Rose, you want to go for a bit of a roam. If you want to try and, like, match Jake, I can play Ezreal. You know, gin guys or whatever it may be. Yeah. Because I think then you parallel it with somebody like Voice, who's shown that he will play AP mages in the bot lane. He'll play the Ziggs. He'll play the 
Seraphine. So there's mm. like some flexibility there as to how the supports actually want to link up to try and be the, the third man, the, the third wheel, the helping hand. Yeah, a, a lot of eyes are going to be down there in that bot lane and our interview is going to be with the opposing bot laner. We do have Voice here joining us. Hey, Voice, uh, how are you feeling for this matchup against Vertex and, you know, knowing that Dante's coming back into the roster going up against him? Um, I feel like in general, we're pretty confident. I think uh, we've been practicing hard. We've definitely got an idea of how we want to play the game. I don't really think like which ADC I play against really matters because at the end of the day, like champions are just champions. The way we play the game is the way we play the game. So we'll just play our game and hopefully win. Speaking of playing a game, you guys haven't had uh, the most amazing performance so far. It's been a little bit shaky, but what would you say in terms of growth or areas that you've been focusing on has gone for you so far over in Kanga? Um, the main thing we focused on is just kind of figuring out how we wanted to play as a team. We've been experimenting quite a bit with different champion picks, different ways that we can try and close out games. I think our week one against Ground Zero was pretty unlucky, to be honest. We just kind of messed up in the second game. I think in game one, we definitely showed like what we can do. It's just we needed to be consistent in that. And then versus Chiefs, we were probably cooking a bit too much. So as long as we just go back to the form that we can always play out, then we should be good. That's a good deal. So, Voice, speaking of cooking a bit too much, what are you playing today? <laughs> Do we going back to the traditional AD carry, a hyper carry, or are we locking Zig Seraphine? Don't worry, we won't, we won't tell the other team. <laughs> Our little secret. Um, I don't know. We'll see, I guess. Uh, we'll see? I, I don't mind playing Seraphine. I think Champion's really fun. I think uh, people complain too much about that champ. I think she's really fun, but we'll Fair see enough. if I play it or not. Who knows? Is it time for Karthus? <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to ask? Nah, that's all I had. All right. Well, we'll let you go, boys. We'll get you ready for this uh, best of two. But look, good luck. All right, see ya. See, see ya. ya. Nice. Jinx. Hopefully he locks Jinx. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Jinx Actually, and hopefully what? he picks up Jinx. If in doubt. What are my predictions? In? Maybe I don't want him to lock Jinx. True. 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 We'll get there in a little we'll bit. We'll there. talk about our pro predi pred ugh. I couldn't even say the word prediction. Prediction. <laughs> Predictions. Uh, before that, those side selects, that might influence some people's predictions back at home because both teams picking themselves up blue side. We've seen blue side have, what is it, like a 96% win rate? I think there's only been two red side wins. Um, so blue side, it makes sense that a lot of teams would be picking it. Are you guys a blue side? You always want blue side on Divals? Nah, pick red side, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to mind control the, the <laughs> audience and your yeah, competitors out don't there. Don't worry, we're picking red side tomorrow, right Definitely guys? Definitely right? red side, yeah. yeah. Now look, blue side is just OP. You have the first pick, you have a bunch of OP characters, right? Nico, Milio, like we've seen so far. If you're red side, ban these champions. If you're going to open them, make sure you prep the counter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes sense, although it does come down to draft, uh, when it does come to winning or losing. Mm -hmm. But predictions. Dare fan vote. You guys can put your votes in on who you think is going to be winning this matchup. Over Come on, Poltron. There. Come on, Poltron. Yeah, we're going to... So is this the way no? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 Matt was throwing me off. He was pointing this way. I was pointing He's to you. Pointing oh, you're pointing you. to me. You point okay. Up there. We can all point. Up there. It <laughs> up is there. over up there. Here. Yeah, you can put in your votes using your channel points uh, for our Dare fan vote. And you guys might end up on a better score than... What? Last split, I think. You guys in Twitch chat ended up on a better score than everyone. everyone. All the talent. Twitch you guys beat all the talent. At the moment, I don't think it's looking too red hot. Hopefully, we can pull up the predictions uh, for what we think of this series. And look, I'm only on four. I haven't been doing the best. Okay. Very original, guys. Yeah, yeah. quite, uh, quite We've all gone for draws here. Mm -hmm. Max is skimmy, though. If you guys just keep doing the same thing, you could tie. Rusty. Ooh. We're going to 2-0 for Kanga. Okay. We're going to take first place. We're taking We're first place. We've won it, it. We've yeah. won it <laughs> Wow, it's you're so that free. confident, huh? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. Twitch chat, you guys are on four with me as well. And, and Poltron, obviously, this is your first time yeah. predicting. So let's hear from you why you think it's a 1-0. 1-0? 1-1. Can't be a 1-0. Best of twos. <laughs> well, yeah, I think the big thing is Dante's finally in. Dante mm -hmm. is the difference maker for Vertex in my mind. But I don't think the rest of their team is good enough to have a clean 2-0. I think Kanga again, not a bad team, but they've had a few rough spots. So that's why I'll give it the 1-1. Okay, so you think that they can excel when they have that sort of blue side. There's going to be a lot of learning curves mm. as well, bounce backs between uh, game one and game two. Yeah, I think both teams should win on the blue side. But again, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. We will, we will.
What about you, Max, some info on your prediction? Yeah, so I, I like the Kanga 1-1 prediction because Kanga tends to do a very similar thing where they have one um, good draft where they pick like Cassio or whatever, and then they have their fun draft where <laughs> Fido gets to play Akshan or something of the like, right? And it's very experimental. Now, Voice did say that we're trying to cook a bit less, right, to bring that in, mm -hmm. but I still think that, you know, if Cassio ever gets through the draft, the game where Vertex are playing on blue side, they're just going to ban it because they have that freed up, right? And that really yep. takes away a huge spanner. So I think... Teams are pretty similar level in skill, especially with Dante coming back. I'm just yep. going to say a 1-1. One, one. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and for you, Skim, do you think it's the same thing? Like, where is the fine line of having too much fun in a draft, but maybe being too safe? Or is there no such thing as too safe? I wouldn't say there's anything as too safe. I feel like uh, if that was ever the case, the, the drafts are too premeditated. You've seen them a billion times in scrims that you sort of say, well, we know exactly how this one's going to play on out. I think mm. this, yeah, blue side of trading the OPs, I think is going to be the defining factor for me. I feel like you might get in your head a little bit too much on the receiving end. So how do we try and counter this? Um, and we've seen from a lot of these games, right, that like the mental isn't the biggest issue here because they are turning things around. We are getting draws. So I, I'm, I'm quite confident that, yeah, with the return of Dante, it should be the difference maker to, to close it out. All right, well, we're going to see just how OP uh, this blue side is. There's going to be a fun draft. There's going to be a safe draft because Champ Select is ready for our first BO2. That certainly is. So let's crack on with it then. Let's see what it looks like as Vertex kick things off here on the blue side. Another one's to showcase what it all looks like with a rejuvenated roster, a full strength team. And already Vertex coming out and taking away, really attacking Shinky's champion pool, right? The Scion, he whipped that out last week. Gragas, you mentioned it, 100% winner in the top lane, a very safe champion. That can neutralize a lot of lanes, and they're going to get rid of that already. You can see the freedom blue side gives you to really target ban out the main champions you're worried about. So you can, right, with the Gragas, the Scion, as well as the Azir. Cassiopeia appears still left up and available if there was to be a fifth pick counter pick angle for Fido. Um, to utilize, but I'm curious to see where Vertex go with this one. If it is, this going to be the case of locking Cassante. It's up, it's available, it's a little bit too strong. Yeah, absolutely. And that really brings into question, you know, where that is played on Vertex, right? Can it be a mid top flex? Is it just going to be the top lane pick? But it's going to be the Maokai. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever you see a Maokai in drafts, you can almost 100% guarantee a Jace is going to be picked alongside it. That mid jungle pairing is just so strong, even if you could play it towards the top side, right? Just gives you so much zone control. And there's the Shaker Hover, giving credit to Poltron. Yep, shout out to Poltron there. So, uh, you know, paying on his, as you already mentioned. I think it's a really good point you mentioned uh, regarding the Maokai. We saw, obviously, uh, who was it, Grand Zero that played it with the, the Rakan and all the rest, all just at the Ari rather, and all just coming together, just on CD. Too much CC to really try and handle. I think this certainly is the, 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 the rule, right? Approach, especially into an immobile AD carry, something like an Aphilios. And it's very reliable. That's the thing. You look at a champion like Maokai and compare it to something like a Nidalee that Forever was playing in the first week, yeah. right? If you really are thinking, okay, this is a must-win game, we need to go back to our fundamentals, make it as easy as possible for yourself. Pick something like the Maokai where realistically, your only goal is to pick whichever lane you want to get ahead, skirmish around them, level 60 ultimate coming out really, really strong. So a very fundamental pick that allows for a lot of plays to be made off the back of it. So he does. The Phileos locked in there with the Vi as well for some deep diving gauge to guarantee that uh, that season's assist will find its target and will lock them down for sure. Curious to see what comes out in the mid lane here for Chirp. Uh, in particular, two games of Syndra, two games of Annie. You know, that is a bit of a mid lane wizard, so would love to see really where that would go. But with Jinx up and available, they feel threatened enough by some of that diving potential already shown by Kanga that, nope, Zaya will be the answer instead. Peel, protect, and obviously the Featherstorm. Yeah, playing Vine to Zaya is an absolutely mir miserable experience if you are Mayfun, right? You press that ultimate, basically gets traded on cooldown, and then you're in the back line trying to fire. And this is going to be one of Chirp's signature picks when he was coming up. The, the Victor provides so much lane dominance in terms of your trading 1v1, and it can also play very well into Fido's champion pool. You look at his close range champions, such as the Cassiopeia, mm -hmm. has a really hard time into Victor in the laning phase. Yes, yeah, it certainly does. It's going to be a case of uh, probably two Titans in the late game in this mid lane, especially. Uh, look at a showcase who can reign supreme. Uh, is that third pick going into the second half of the pick and ban is going to be the Orn here, actually. So Shinky playing a, another champion, have to imagine. Uh, another safe standard champion that you'd add to your arsenal as a budding new top laner. And should hopefully give them some staying power once those ornaments come along. It's almost like we're gearing up for that late game uh, finale. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a great idea to take it on three here. You know, limit any potential limiting of the champion pool to come through from Vertex, right? We already saw that they invested two bans towards Shinky 
already. So make sure he's able to play something he's comfortable, make sure he's something that he's not going to just get ran over in lane. But the question for me, Skimmy, heading into the second phase is, what's Fido playing here, right? Mm. If you're Vertex, you're assuming both bands are going to be targeted towards him, potentially removing something like a Xerath, potentially removing something like a Tristana if they were to run a double AD carry comp. But realistically, Fido said he's been cooking. He's probably going to have to whip something out like that now. Well, they've actually gone for a Vex ban of all things there. Champion that we've not seen in such a long time, but has a world where it certainly can be uh, be viable. Uh, I am very curious to see if they were just to, you know, commit all their further bans towards him to make sure that his uh, impact is going to be muted. I feel like we've already mentioned that mid-jungle should be the defining factor in this series alone. So if you can look to try and, you know, lopside that either way, um, it should uh, really give yourself a helping hand. It's going to be the Gwen as well as the Rakana champion that uh, Jake has been playing a whole bunch of, but we know that Rosie is a, a big fan too. Yeah, definitely. And Zyra Rakan, not a pairing you want to be going up against under any circumstances. Just very reliable, very safe in lane, and then provides so many playmaking opportunities as you head in towards that mid late game. Now, Gwen being removed, that is one of Tomasino's, you know, quintessential picks into something like the Orn. What does he go to now? He's been known to play more with those Bruiser champions, think like Fiora, Camille, something like that. I doubt he brings one of those out today, but mm -hmm. you know, if he's got any chance in any matchup in the league to really show off and put on his carry pants, it's today as, you know, Fido said he was cooking and that is definitely a spicy pick. That is a very spicy pick. I'm curious to see what brand of it we do get, but I'd love to see some AP Varus in particular for that one shot potential, right? I've seen the clips where a Cho'Gath gets all the blight and suddenly one piercing arrow and then you're thinking, how on earth is that balance? So this is definitely him cooking and saying, look, you try and ban me out, you know, between splits, I've added another five champions. He can play anything. It really, it really is the case with Fido where it, just as you think you've got him in a corner in terms of his champion pool, he whips something else crazy out. And yeah, the Varus, Obviously, actually going to be one of the champions that can outrange Victor mm. in the mid to late game, right? That ultimate's so threatening that if Victor ever missteps, if anyone really missteps, can get caught out with that ultimate. And obviously, he's going to be the AP variant, just gets one shot with that Q. Yeah, the Rift Maker just a little bit too powerful to facilitate all of that. As Vertex are going to lock themselves in here, a Nautilus to make their bot lane a little bit more explosive to try and set the tone as to how that matchup should play out. And a Cassante that we expected as a first pick is actually going to be the last pick here for Vertex. Instant response from Kanga. Jake says, Nap, it's a Brom angle here. And we fight fire with fire. Yeah, so this is very interesting to me. Both comps sort of have opportunities for engage, but at the same time, there's a lot of disengage as well, mm -hmm. right? You look at something like a Maokai, like a Zai for the side of Vertex, whereas Kanga have that Brom, they have that Orn that can peel back into Felios, who obviously likes to play front to back. So. To me, this is really going to be about stable top. The only real volatility is going to come around that mid jungle at level six and potentially off the back of some nice Nautilus plays. What are you expecting to be uh, the real difference maker here? Is it going to be the fact that you do have spicy champions like Averis that can potentially upset the balance or is just the engage and the simplicity of what Vertex have put together maybe a little bit too much to bear? It's very much dependent on their access to Varus in the late game, right? If they are able to consistently find engages with a Cassante, with a Maokai, they can just pick him off before the fight even starts. And Varus, obviously not a mobile champion, can get caught out by CC and fall victim to that. That being said, right, there is a Braum, there is the opportunity for Kanga to play at range. And if they're able to execute on that comp, Vertex have to run into you and you are more than happy taking that front to back fight. Is that really going to be the name of the game, this, uh, this situation, right? Is it going to be front to backs on repeat or are we really looking to try and, you know, get creative given the similarities between both teams? Is it a lot more to do with who can get the flanking angle, who can look to try and say, hey, I'm here and he's a mobile carries then say, well, what on earth do we do? Yeah, absolutely. If you can get someone like Vi on an angle, right, onto the Zyre, able to force out an attacker from multiple angles, right, you Vi ult, then you have an Orn Horn coming through and you can really actually pile the CC on top of her so that Featherstorm isn't actually worth anything in the end but that being said i am expecting a nice clean 5v5 front to back our tanks are going to stand in front we're going to stare at each other at a dragon and then whichever ad carry plays better is going to get the win he's going to come out on heads and uh well certainly a, a matchup to be excited for right zaya comes into the mix once again it's a double ad carry setup but not in the way you would imagine but i'm going to be giving us a treat here with an ap varus in the mid lane to kickstart week number three as we jump into the rift to see how these two teams fight fire with fire. Vertex still searching for that win and Kanga looking to prevent that with a very spicy level one. Yeah, and this is a very cheeky strategy. This is a patented Nautilus tech where you five-man sprint mid, force the flash. You are more than happy with that trade, right? And we talked about it's hard to get on top of the Varus. Not so much the case when he loses flash level one and your jungler still has it. We saw this happen last week, if I uh, remember correctly, right? It was them targeting Fighter with the first blood, or at least the first flash of the game. Really limited his impact to try and be aggressive. 
um, and certainly is the right place to try and target to get the ball rolling. That's exactly right. When you think about your preparation for a team like Kanga, we talk about it every week on the desk that it is fighter you have to target. And it's very clear to me that teams are coming in with that game plan in mind. They've got these pre-prepared level ones to really dampen Kanga's main source of power. Well, let's see then if anything else will take place in these uh, early moments of the game. You can see the Vertex in the river, going to be standing on a ward nicely placed there by the Kanga side. So not going to fall victim to any cheeky level one strats as the lanes or rather the minions crash. That's the learning phase we go. And it'll be a chance to see Chirp on another signature champion. And Chokus V has it really in his locker to uh, take down somebody as esteemed as Fido. And interestingly as well, Fido has opted for the Presti attack, right? Really gives you a lot of early game power. You couple that with a three stack Blight, for example, and then a WQ on top of that. You can really get a lot of damage going. So Victor, a very strong champion in the early game, but Varus can fight back in his own right. Certainly once level six is there, right? The Chain of Corruption naturally stacking up the Blight makes it very easy to learn that combo at four uh, potency. So. I'm excited to see this one come into effect and the matchup that no doubt will be checking in on repeat a fair bit, given that we put a bit of an emphasis um, towards that mid-jungle matchup as to where they are. Speaking of the junglers, they both are on the same quadrant of the map at the moment. Seemingly looking to path from top to bottom. Yeah, absolutely. The only real sense of action we're going to get here is off the back of this jungle pathing. Both junglers opting for this full clear route, acknowledging that you know bot lane is really the point of power for both teams. I wouldn't be surprised if Mayfun decides to try to get a cheeky little playoff here off the back of getting his camps done, but we can see that Forever acknowledging that this window could exist, throwing that sapling, making sure there's no chance of them catching Vertex off guard. This really is the case. They've drawn the attention of their own bot lane up here to guarantee that this blue buff will be denied from Mayfun. Sapling obviously lowers his HP bar a little bit more. He's already resigned himself to taking the Wolves instead. Great play here from Vertex to kickstart what their strategy could be, burn a flash in the mid lane and, uh, you know, put Mayfun behind. And how night and day different is this to the debut game of Vertex, right? Where Forever is going for that invade by himself, gets yep. collapsed upon by three members. Here, Vertex have a very clear plan. Okay, we've got that huge wave crashing bot lane. We'll walk in with you, we'll get the blue buff. So already showing improvement from their earlier showings. And by all accounts, they've been grinding really hard on solo queue. I believe uh, Tim told us that currently ranked three now on yeah. the ladder. So looking to try and showcase that it's not a fluke that I'm in this position. I really want to prove what I can do individually. And uh, what well, the proof will really be in the pudding if they can uh, find a win here in this series today. Going to look to try and get a little bit more tempo and, uh, and vision around this uh, side of the map. You'd imagine, as you already mentioned, I think during that drafting phase, that a lot of these fights are going to be a case of, you know, waiting for dragons or heralds to spawn, converge as many members as you can there to try and get a bit of a lead. Would you expect full 5v5s that early on, or are we going to be leaning more towards, would you say, the AD carry sitting in lane and say, ah, let's get some turret plates? I'd be saying from 10 minutes on, the second those teleports become unlocked for the top laners, you can expect a 5v5, right? Neither of these top laners are particularly selfish both in player and champion identity, as we see a bit of training going on towards the bot lane. Yeah, training nearly uh, resulting in a kill there as uh, Voice finds himself fairly worse for wear. No potions left, does have the red weapon, but very limited uh, stacks of that in hand. So Vertex can play this one as slowly as they like and just really look to bleed them out. Yeah, absolutely. And keep in mind, Forever is towards this bot side. There's no sums on Voice, no heal. This could be a potential dive. It's a huge wave for Voice to miss out on. This would be a massive dive if it was to be successful. You can see some deep vision there to try and protect him in their side of the tri bush. A dive looks to be inevitable. Rosie is poising himself very nicely. Just running past Jake says, I don't really care about you. But if we get you instead, we'll take you instead. The hook doesn't connect. The aggro is juggled beautifully. And Dante returns to the scene to get a first blood. Yeah, perfectly played there. You can tell Vertex have that communication, setting that play up in advance. Even if they just walk Voice away from that turret, it's a huge loss for the AD carry of Kanga. But Jake says, no, I've got to stay. I've got to make sure you get this CS and ultimately ends up going down. So a really well played dive, like you mentioned, Skimmy, with that aggro juggling, starting Vertex's game off strong. Best possible start really for them. They've had a clear draft or a clear strategy in mind from the very get-go in this game. And everything has gone their way so far. I mean, the trading hasn't really been matched to try and answer back to some of the aggression that Vertex have shown. Potential indication of that being returned now as there is going to be a three-way convergence on the mid lane. The Chirp does have flash available. This was a very uh, common pitfall for Vertex in their previous series, right? With Chirp on the Annie, was getting targeted. as his level six. There it is, Shane Corruption laid out with a stasis, stun, and one-shot delete. I mean, you can't even flash. As soon as the attendees come out, you're in trouble. 
To be honest, that's a bit of an experience, but I'll hold that thought as we've got another skirmish potentially. They just fizzle out here as uh, Kanga with three members strong will look to try and zone them out of their own side of the jungle, but just going to patiently return to lane. Yeah, but back to my previous point, it does speak to the inexperience of Chirp a little bit there, right? Not respecting that support roam window, as well as that level six, right? When you're playing against Varus, hook just Ooh. missing from Rosie there. But when you're playing against the Varus, that level six window, you need to be tracking that. You need to know that, hey, as soon as this guy takes this minion, I am going to be under threat and Chirp not, not acknowledging that, a big start for Fido. Certainly is, and uh, the perfect start in retaliation, the response that Kanga fans would have been hoping for. Interesting is the Dare fan vote here with the majority of you actually going Vertex favored. So, didn't really see that one coming. I would have thought uh, a lot more 50-50. A lot of Dante fans. Skimmy, if I'm I remember sure. anything correctly, this man commands a huge fan base. And rightly so from what he's shown. But a lot of attention giving, getting given towards this bot lane voice. Still no sums. In fact, not a single summoner for the bot lane of Kanga at all. A really tough position if the wave continues to be frozen like it is. Yeah, just getting completely zoned away. And that CS lead, I mean, look at it already. 24 CS down. I mean, it's a massive difference at this stage. You'd imagine that Dante would be up a healthy amount of gold already to showcase what he can do and really going to help them out quite handily given that these objectives are about to be up together in the next 40 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. And with the window that Vertex are using to take this dragon, it actually opens up a potential for them to look at both objectives, right? There is still 30 seconds available. The Cassante versus Orn matchup, very much Cassante and Orn can sort of move past each other, shove those waves, and then look down. And I'd say a skirmish right now, if the Vi level 6 comes through and you can target Chirp and blow him up, as here it comes against Skimmy. Chirp, no, he's gone for it. He says, look, if you go for the combo, I'll do it right back at you. He's going to try and take out fun. Fido, but it's not to be enough. Forever jumps in and pounces and says, I might have to trade my life for this one. It's going to be a one for one so far. The benefit being that Fighter was the one to get the kill. Or is it the Maokite that gets it instead? Jake doesn't care. He's done his damage. He'll get his assist. But Mayfan picks up the bounty. Mayfan played that nastily. This flash Q prediction was perfect fighting Chirp, who once again was just playing a bit too far up, not respecting that Varus ulti is. What is Rosie doing here? Rosie here, baiting him and looking to say, this Herald will not be free. We've got more members in the area right now. Look at Dante's positioning for the rip back of the Febbers. It is absolutely primed and perfect. Thomasin is the one to remove Mayfan, having already made the heroics happen. A top laner rocks up and gets in on the kills. That's Dante's second of the game, and they really did just get double objectives. Yeah, absolutely. A huge rotation from Dante there. It's sort of the case in Os where if your AD carry runs up to a play, it's probably going to end up well as Chirp is just going to catch this wave. So not even losing that much on the opposite side of things. A really nice rotation from Dante, and they get rewarded with the Herald. Yeah, they certainly do. It all starts once again in the mid lane, and two them just cracking her ultimate. Yeah, absolutely. And so we see the initial play. Look at Chirp's flash. Mayfun follows it perfectly, reads him like a book, forever flashes, picks up Fido on the backside of things, but he goes down in the end of it. And just Mayfun, you know, didn't have the strongest showing last split, but he was a rookie talent for a reason, right? That mechanical ability was never in question. And here, he's demonstrating that to its fullest. It certainly is uh, a bit of a treat to watch those uh, little micro outplays and predictions, if you will, come to fruition and be done on the stage as opposed to, you know, hitting behind solo queue or in those scrims where you know, maybe feels good for the ego, but not for the audience. Absolutely. Audience getting given a treat here as we check in with our top laners. Nothing much, you know, Tomasino basically experiencing the top lane, uh, top lane lifestyle of if your team's winning, you're winning, showing in his KDA 101. Managed to crack a plate as well. Very, you know, stock standard top lane affair. But the, to me, this mid lane again, Chirp hasn't really settled down at all in terms of how aggressive he's playing this lane. He's got to really time this Varus ulti though, because anytime he steps up, he doesn't have flash. If Mayfun's there, it's just a kill. So either Vertex are going to have to really make sure they're investing resources to play around him, or he's going to have to settle a little bit. I'm sure Forever's probably got his work cut out for him as to do I try and, you know, stem the bleeding in this mid lane because they are definitely having a bit of an ego battle on ultimate cooldown CDs, right? Um, but, you know, do I just play towards Dante who's already come in and had an absolute blinder so far ahead of this Philios, which we've seen is the most played champion, but the win rate hasn't really been up there. So perhaps you play to desire the vices. I can never actually target them and 1v9. I mean, take a look at the item discrepancy between 80 carries right now. A full Kraken Slayer for Dante compared to two Long Swords and Berserker Greaves in the side of Voice. The damage that these two are putting out isn't even comparable. Not to mention how hard it is to actually get on top of Dante and stick to him with all the peel that he has. And you can see there, 4.6k compared to Voice, who's only 
just about to crack 3k. That is monumental. And the biggest crime for me is the fact that Voice is just barely higher than Rosie, the Vertex support, right? So, I mean, so, so down and out on a champion that needs resources, needs to really, uh, you know, hit that two item breakpoint nice and early to really have a, a cracking chance when those Moonlight Vigils goes out in these, uh, in these big skirmishes. But happy days as to be expected here by Dante. Top lane is still going to be having a bit of a crack at it whenever they have a chance. But Vertex with so much confidence exuding now, just freely roaming, placing vision, and just basically saying, wherever you go, Kango, we've got our eyes in the sky ready to take you down. Absolutely, and it's all stemming off the back of Dante's pressure, right? He is able to basically 1v2 this lane, just pushing the wave whenever he likes. That grants Vertex the freedom to walk into the jungle and get those deep boards. And we talked about having to make room for Chirp to play as here comes the Maokai ultimate, they're going for a dive. Matrix Grass decided off, Vincent TP comes out, their job is done. They've baited out a massive summoner. They don't need to really commit to this any much more than that. A Blast going to disengage from away. A Vi ultimate that goes across the wall. There is the Featherstorm, there is the rip back, and it connects onto two. And Dante's now got three. Rosie across the wall, the depth charges. Don't worry guys, I've got this Varus. The Moonlight Vigil goes across. The Piercing Arrow is enough. Dante? And then the Chaos Storm to try and take down Fire just out of range. Dante's stuck. He has nowhere to go. And Sherp says, I need to try and salvage this place somehow, some way. Voice flashing over to Stasis Trap and another Piercing Arrow to make this Phyto 4 and 1. But somehow Kanga make that work. It starts off with Mayfun going over the wall, getting caught way out of position. And then it just felt like Vertex wanted to make more of something that they should have just let go. Flashes coming over the wall. Shinky ending up going down. Shinky, what am I saying? As we take a look at this play again, Rosie and Forever wanting to start off the dive with that Maokai ultimate. As soon as that TP comes through, let's back out. But it's Dante who takes that Vi ult, gets across the wall with it, and Mayfun gets one shot here. You think the play's done, the TP's coming through, but it's Vertex getting a bit too overconfident, overstepping their mark, and ending up giving the fight to Kanga. Yeah, and this is obviously what we can see here, a bit the proof of the pudding of that. Rosie jumps, and the rest of the team saying, well, we've got to commit then. We've got to run around the long way. We've got to commit summoners of our own overextended and really giving Kanga an avenue back into this game where it didn't look possible. Absolutely, and Fido definitely the main benefactor here, right? Getting the shutdown, getting that kill onto Chirp as well, and Voice, who was once so far behind, a bit more equal in gold, still yet to die despite the gold deficit he's at, and now we've got a Nash's Tooth completed for Fido as this second drag spawns. So much on-hit damage to complement the Blight stacks as the second dragon comes to life. Call of the Forge God goes out, knocks up three members. Rosie's in focus right now, but the Fane is onto Mayfire, who falls on down. Dante picks up that next one. Into the back line goes Tomasina, looking to try and knock them down with all out mode. He's going to die and give Fido a fifth, but it doesn't matter because Fido died in the end. They're going to fight a little bit more. Chirp's going to try and even out the uh, power discrepancy in this mid lane, and a massive fight where Voice was really a passenger. That's exactly right. It's an incredibly close fight, and Voice isn't even there. You do have to wonder what could have happened if he walked up to that fight, but you know, ultimately we talked about these top laners getting involved as soon as those TPs come on, and that's certainly what happened here. As we see, it's a great on horn initially from Shinky, finding three members, but look at how Tomasino splits the fight. Comes in, places pressure onto the Varus, Onto the onto the Braum rather, and is able to really separate it so Kanga can get taken down one by one. And Skimmy, these health bars are blinking for Vertex. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better sort of juggling of the aggro, really. I mean, it's not even a turret they're playing with now. It's just jumping into a fight, playing with that tolling of uh, Fog of War. I suppose really utilizing the fact it was a 5v4 uh, affair. Yeah, absolutely. Voice wanting to get some bit more gold back before he enters any fight. Not feeling too great after the landing phase that he had as. Vertex not relenting, pressure on this dragon. They've brought Tomasino down. Shiki does have the TP, but no Ornhorn crucially, so Vertex is going to look to start this dragon up. They're going to return back to that second dragon, and this time with really no contest from Kanga being shown. It should be a freebie for them to acquire. Put them on good pace then to get a uh, soul point if they were to uh, play towards that. As for Kanga though, they're going to veer their head in towards the top side of the river and look towards this Herald instead. Question is, will Vertex contest? Yeah, it might not be actually as free as they think. Four members of Vertex are here. Chirp with the TP. Here goes Rosie. Rosie's looking for the hook, and the hook connects. Nature's Grass, once again, that is the focus. Can we lock down these key members? Jakey, we don't care about you. Aphelios, we want you. And that is what they'll get. Tomasino picks that one up, and the Herald has to crucially be denied. They run away from it. Somehow, though, Shinky's rocked up and absolutely mobbed Dante, who's dead now for the moment. Fido comes in and showcases just how strong he is on the Varus during the mid-game. Tomasino drags Mayfun through that and says, I'll have a crack at a little bit more. Knocks Tomasino. him back when the Antofo strikes. Is literally trying to do it all so fast, saying that top laners can 
actually contribute a fair bit to these skirmishes. And once again, a back and forth fight that ends up going this time in the favor of Vertex. It starts out with Mayfan, who has been playing so well this entire game, finding this pick onto Dante. As here we go. The initial engage comes out onto Braum, and as a byproduct of voice, it just gets taken down. Really not much he can do once that depth charge has been cast on him. But look at the TP coming in behind from Shinky, and look at the way they pin to Dante. No time to react with the ultimate, taken down immediately. But it's Thomasina who's ultimately the MVP of this fight. Once he goes all out, there's no real damage to actually pressure him, right? Fido is removed, not able to get in here, and so Kasante can just run him up. Yeah, Fido at this point is just playing from uh, a distance, actually going to fall on down to the sapling. So low, nearly died to that sapling, and powered by the bush. Wasn't to be enough there, but if he were to crucially fall on the back end, that's a whole bunch of extra gold. It certainly is, and speaking of gold, Tomasino sitting pretty with a 300 gold bounty here. Really is going to be a question of can Fido get taken down? Because when you're looking at someone like Tomasino, who's sitting 100 gold from the top spot, he's got so much armor that if Varus isn't able to hit him, if Varus isn't able to detonate, you know, the max health percentage on that blight, you really wonder how long it's going to take Voice to kill him. Absolutely. I mean, Dante and Tomasino still had their way with their own laners, haven't they? Uh, up by such a significant margin, but quite rightly so. If there's not enough uptime for Fido to ramp up with that blight, uh, a very squishy all-out mode, Cassante still will not be falling down. See, Mayfar now having a bit of a crack here in the side lane sure. to try and take out Chirp. Corrupting chains do not connect, and Chirp this time isn't going to fall prey to that intent. They tried to make something happen, given that uh, the bot lane of Vertex are squared up in the mid lane now, looking to find what is going to be their third turret now, all outers. But here's the trade back, right? You look for a play towards that bot side, doesn't go in your favor, and then suddenly Thomasina can just walk in. You've got the pressure to take the mid lane turret. What I want to call out there is Chirp just playing with the utmost confidence, walking up, you know, saying, you can throw the Varus ultimate, I'm just going to sidestep it, having that confidence. And, you know, we talked about confidence being a potential issue for Chirp. Certainly this game, not the case. Certainly isn't. I mean, he's shown almost a degree of arrogance in terms of how he's approached, uh, you know, the Varus in a lot of these fights when he has fallen victim to a gank and a death. There's Mayfun rocking up, going in for a charge and realizing, uh, I don't actually want to be here anymore. The depth charge connects the flash from Rosie to guarantee the passive, the root, and the damage to deliver. Forever finds himself in that one, and Tomasino is single handedly zoning back the remaining members of Kanga here. It's a 1v3 as the rest of his team are protected so they can safely recall. Yeah, I'm stunned that player ended up going as well as it did. As soon as Vi basically takes that Q, Dante completes his base. So it's a 5v4 off the back of it, but Mayfan just too squishy gets taken down and then all that CC that we mentioned piling on. Fido has no flash. What's he going to do as a Varus? Ultimately, it feels like Vertex are using their vision, creating these pockets of opportunity and really constricting where Kanga can play. You can see it all starts off with a premeditated cue to try and jump on in, realizing that's not where I want to be. And by this point, Kanga, once again, they're just split. Yeah, and look at Tomasino, you called it out. 3v1, ults the Braum, because, you know, why not? Just wants to have that all-out mode activated. They can't even kill him when he's lost all of his resistances. So it's a real worry if Tomasino can continue to do this every fight, separate the backline, and allow his team to find those picks on the other side of the fight. Checking in with the gold as a result as we fast approach the 20 minute mark point of this game. Up by six and a half thousand gold, our vertex sitting very pretty for the lanes we've already mentioned. That's and I'm looking eyes. at the mid lane. You talked about confidence before, I mentioned arrogance. He's got a Medj Eyes at 10 stacks, he's filling himself. To have a Medj Eyes in a game where there's an Orn, Vi, and a Varus is just crazy. I, I just love it. He doesn't even have a stopwatch. If he gets altered by any one of those players, he's dead. Right, but he's saying, you know, you know, even though Vial's a point and click, all the other ones, they're not going to hit me. I'm going to be fine. So Chirp certainly feeling confident on this champion. That being said, if there's one character who I'm looking at on the side of Kanga to really be able to equalize the game and get them back into it, it is this Varus. Rift Maker, Nash's Tooth completed. This is the big spike, spike for that Varus. And here he goes, trying to find Tomasino. I don't know if you win this one, buddy. Well, this is what we get excited about. He's got his ultimate in about 10, or rather, he's uh, flashed in about 10 seconds. He's stacking up as much as he can. The piercing arrow, I don't think it connected. I think he's missed it. And all that ramp meant nothing. A TP comes in, and the cavalry to try and back up fighter there is quickly dismissed. As Chirp adds another chapter to that book. It was a close 1v1, but ultimately, Fido, like you said, not landing that last piercing arrow means he is going to go down in that 1v1, and it's 20 minutes, Skimmy, but Vertex have the damage. They have the ability to do this Baron. 
and they're going to blow this game wide open. And if we we're thinking that Chirp was going to take us foot off the pedal and say, look, I don't have to be as much of a carry now that Dante is back in NX. I think he's been looking at those stats we were mentioning before, averaging 30, 34% uh, percent of his teams overall. He still wants to be the main man here for Vertex. He absolutely does. And with the Rabbitons almost coming online as well, his damage is going to be second to none. Absolutely able to rip through anyone on Kango who missteps. And you look at this team comp, right? Besides the Orn, you've got a Vi who's got Black Cleaver. You've got a Braum whose only purchase really is Mercury Treads. Mm. They are both going to get absolutely shredded as this front line. So the question to me is how do they starve? How do they sorry, stop this bleeding? and are able to get to a 40-minute mark. Yeah, because, I mean, the the big thing we raised before is, is it's going to be a lot of 5v5s, and what that has been, I think the, the biggest downfall for Kanga is that they've been split on multiple occasions, whether that be Vertex with great positioning of their own through good uh, good utilization of Top vision. Lane. They've just been able to pick apart Kanga at every single point. Fighter's going to return here. He's burnt in the flash, and now is this his opportunity to deliver the pain of an AP Varus. The hook goes Ooh. out, and this time the piercing arrow connects. And into Rosie, can he do much more? Well, he tried. Dante rocked up and ended that party very, very quickly. Quarter of the Forge God goes out, goes one way, knocks him up the other, but Chirp is now unstoppable. He is six and three. 18 stacks for the Magi's, make that 20. And with four turrets already and a Baron Max, they're sieging. Yeah, they absolutely are. I wonder how much they're going to be able to get, whether they want to look for something past the inhibitor. It starts off with a 1v1 fighter finally getting the better of Tomasino in that skirmish. But once it gets to a front-to-back situation, there is simply not the damage on Kanga to win. There's too much health, there's too much damage the Vertex are putting out, and it's going to be the inhibitor, it's going to be the fight going in their favor. The real tragedy for me is we're yet to see, well, I want to say like the last 10 minutes now, a true, proper 5v5. It's even members getting picked apart in the side lanes, members running to try and back them up, and things like this happen. Yeah, here we go again. It starts with Kasanta getting melee range onto the Varus, but there's so much percent health damage coming through, flashing the Q, and then after this, just playing around his blight stacks perfectly. Rosie just out of time there. The Q is cast right before the hook lands. Obviously, once Dante shows up, it is going to take him down. But this is the front to back I was talking about, right? We see Mayfarn frontlining with what health? He has absolutely no opportunity to survive any longer than a couple seconds. Same for Jake, and Voice is trying his best, but cannot compete with the damage of Dante and Chirp. Certainly cannot. And at this point now, those item differentials that you already mentioned are only growing that much bigger. Full item advantage in multiple lanes as it stands. Kraken Stella only now just being picked up to give voice two of his own. But it's a full Phantom Dancer over him here from Dante. I mean, they're going to square up a little bit more here. The Baron has about 15 seconds to go. And if they can take the inhib turret, they put themselves in such a prime position. 5v5s are very hard for Kanga, near impossible. If you are them in this stage, you have to look for something on the split member. Maybe look at a Kasante. It's not the ideal target, but if you can burn a couple ultimates, try to take him down, just ease up that pressure, you can buy yourself a little bit of time. That being said, Vertex do not look like they're relenting. With supers in the top lane, they're going to crack this turret. 11,000 gold down, and with a Baron that's just expired, Vertex still look to pull the trigger and go for gold. They'll find one with a hook, and they'll take down Jakey very easily. Chaos Storm spreading the burn of Leandries left, right, and center, and they're completely zoned back to their fountain. They have to deal with those supers, but that tower is gone, as is their base and as are their teammates. Dante, Dante flashing into life and saying, did you miss me? Because this is what I can do. A Gravitim that can't even execute as Voice is locked inside his fountain. It's one turret and a GG screen. He could potentially do something here. There are incredibly low health bars. There's the all out, Skimmy. It is the all out and it is the kill. It's the execution and it's the delayed ace. It's a 24 minute victory and Vertex get their first W. It was back and forth at points, but really Vertex came into this game with a plan, with a mission that they then executed on. This addition of Dante into the lineup has made them look night and day and a dominant game one performance from the side of Vertex. We were singing his praises and it always feels good to feel in a way a bit vindicated that you know what you're talking about when you say that Dante is one of these hot prospects, young, keen, really wants to prove himself and well, as uh, shown from his interview that that one did not age poorly. He said this was, should be uh, a bit of an easy matchup for him and it certainly did look that way, guys. So I'm really excited to see how this one plays out in game number two with Kangaden getting a chance to play blue side. Yeah, I loved seeing Dante come in here. He had the confidence in the interview. It showed, it translated to them picking it up. But you know, Great Assault maybe pulls him with the blue side because you were, you were a little bit dubious about what they were drafting for themselves, what chance they'd picked up. Yeah, well, I was actually surprised they went for the, I think it was the Victor, Chirp's Victor, yep. blind, on B3, but it worked. 
again it worked. Yeah, Chubb didn't have the most uh, stable performance though from what he's seen before, but it really didn't matter. What mm -hmm. would you say the Poltron was the biggest win condition for them? Or at what point were you like, holy heck, like this is this is a Vertex game? After that first bot dive. Really, after, the first yeah, one? After, I think it was four or five minutes around there, when Dante Dovok got the kill, I'm like, all right, Dante's in, he's calling the shots, he's got that confidence, the team is looking good. Mm -hmm. On I, the no, you keep going. Oh, oh, keep going. I think the second play again, when they had that massive skirmish bot side, Vertex, even though they didn't play it too well, I think it was around the 12-minute mark, the confidence, right? It's all there. Rose is instantly ulting, flashing in, looking for the kill. I think both Dante and Chubb followed up, both flashed in, going for the kill. Again, the play, was it good? No, probably not. <laughs> Better for Kanga, but entertaining for us to watch. Mm -hmm. On the side of uh, Kanga, though, Skimmy, throughout this game, did you feel that there was a timing, an item spike, anything for them that could have given them a way back in? Or were Vertex so ahead every step of the way that even a specific item wouldn't have been able to bring them back in? I think it definitely was the timing, especially on this Varus here when the Rift Maker just got completed, that two item spike. That's when Varus really comes into its own, right? You've got ramping up damage with your Blight, then the true damage to add on top of that, but just kept falling victim. Uh, getting picked apart in the side lane, as you can see here on multiple occasions. Teammates would come in with TPs, they would get baited, they would get picked apart as a result. And really it just felt like Vertex were playing with their food, just looking to showcase that, hey, you can try and draft something a little bit crazy, but we've li really put the rest of your team so far behind that the damage graph completely demonstrates that. Yeah, when I look at the gold difference as well, this graph, it was just exponentially just always growing in favor of Vertex. At no point did it ever swing in this way of, of Kenga having any sort of control max. And I think to me, the biggest issue obviously is your Falios damage, right? You have basically 1.2k more damage than your Braum. Mm -hmm. And that was really the issue this whole game was their front to back was not even comparable because the Aphelos just doesn't have the same damage that the Victor and the Zaya are providing, right? So if you are putting something like an Orn and a Vi versus the Kassante and Maokai, you're just not going to be able to burn through them at comparable speeds. And that was really what led to Kanga's downfall. So was it more Aphelios wasn't putting the damage out, uh, as much damage out, or was it that they were being torn apart in team fights? They couldn't even have a front to back team well, fight. I think Aphelios got Dove on repeat. Fell behind, didn't get that gold, didn't get those kills. Again, Zaya, Dante, huge damage. Mm -hmm. I think one other thing, if you just saw the actual damage spread, I, I think Fido did four times the damage of anyone else on this team. Yeah. And I'll just say really quickly, Fido, if you do go back and watch it, I apologize because one small thing, I played solo queue yesterday. I was filled mid playing Gragas into Fido. <laughs> he played Virus Spin and demolished me. You see, I gave him that false confidence to lock it today. You know, he did okay. I think he wasn't the reason why they lost, but maybe. Yeah, but look, maybe. who knows? I mean, the, the virus still had some good stats, still had some good plays, mm -hmm. but we want to deep dive into those plays that you were just talking about then, Poltron. We got the sure. first blood one. Uh, this was that four minute dive that you were talking about. This one was the clean one that you were uh, impressed with. Well, when I say clean, clean for Vertex, I think one of their best dives so far this split, as we see, let's watch the towel juggle, okay? Rosie tanks, he's still tanking. Tried to get the hook, it's all good. Walks in, get the kill. And if you noticed, Dante held his last order, right? He made sure to walk out of that turret range, get the kill so he wouldn't die. Impressive. Good juggle. I mean, the fact that you even uh, noticed it, pointed out, this is this is why they get him as coach. This is why they get him, Skim. Absolutely. the fine details. <laughs> That's why you're, you're worth the big bucks, mate. <laughs> the other one was, uh, what was it, 12 minute. This was the big fight mm. that wasn't clean, but it was entertaining to it watch. It was entertaining, yeah, yeah. this is the one I really want you to break down because there was a lot <laughs> going on. So the initial dive attempt from Vertex, really good. Forced out the TP, walk back. Hey, let's escape with the blast cone. Now right here, when Mayfung is kidnapped, it's one. Vertex of one. Jake jumps over. He's in trouble. Now look what Rosie does. Instantly flashes in. I like the confidence, but this is not the play. So Rosie gets taken down. Now what's Dante? He's like, all right, I'm not letting my brother in arms, Rosie, die. I'm going to jump in. All right, I'm dead as well. And he's like, Chirp, back me up. I'm going to jump in. All right, Chirp's in. I got the kill, guys. Oh, this guy's got thumbs. Guys, I'm dead. So something that should have started off is great for them. They had the great 
engage. Then they had even better disengage. Then, like you said, they were able to kidnap someone, get the kill mm -hmm. on them. But then they were like, no, we want more. They weren't happy with just that one max. Yeah, and this was one of the rare times in this game that Vertex lacked cohesion. I think yeah. for the most part, for the rest of the game, they seem to do everything quite in sync. But this one, if they just all flash over together, yeah. they win that fight, right? Yeah. But it is like Poltron said, it's a comedy of, I'm going to flash and die. Okay, you're dead. Now I'm going to flash and die. And it really was just that repeat action that allowed Kanga a brief window back in. That being said, every other fight was just so well played and everyone knew their roles that Kanga didn't really have a chance. You say brief, how could you capitalize on something like that? Like if you were in the game or if you were looking at this replay, Poltron, what could you say that Kanga could have done differently? Kanga or Vertex? Kanga, right? Because they were able to get uh, mm. quite a few kills on Vertex. They were able to like change that initiation. Well, I think the initial play was actually not great from Mayfar. Maybe he didn't expect, oh, they're going to blast cone over and Zyra's going to drop me and then I'm dead. But as soon as you TP and they leave, you just, you take it, right? You've already committed your teleport. You've saved your bot lane. Boys can now farm that wave safely. That's the win in your books. You can't go further. Okay. Right. Interesting. I didn't know uh, if there was... Oh, a different way for Kenga to get back in. But like we said, that fight was probably the main thing there and, and nothing else for them. But when we do look towards game two and what needs to be changed up, side change is going to happen. You think there's going to be anything interesting as well when it comes to champ selected um, for either team? Or do you think that this composition could actually work if Vertex wanted to run it back on red side? Let's say they got these picks, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. in, a, in a role, they probably won't, but let's say they did. Well, that's a tough one. I think Vertex aren't going to change too much. Again, they seem very comfortable on at least top, mid, and 80, all on very strong carries or very comfortable champions. I like to word it that way. Mm -hmm. Rosie on Nort, one of his best engaged champions. I haven't seen forever on the Maokai before, but he looked okay. He looked okay, so yeah, they might run it back game two. Potential run it back. To me, this was more an issue of execution, if anything. I think they had a, Kanga had a great way of playing around mid lane in that early game. You know, as soon as that Barisol basically off cooldown was being used to find kills onto Chirp. Yep. But they never really transitioned that into a Dragon 3v3 or a Herald 3v3 where they were combining the Vi, Ornn and Varus ultimates. If you're layering all those on one person, even if it's a Zyre, she is going to end up going down and they never were really able to find that combo. So to me, it's less about draft, more about execution. We only saw that one time when Dante was in a really rough spot and he got headbutt against the wall, just completely, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. taken apart. You, you want to see more of that. I think just, yeah, the, the cohesion, the sort of lack of execution, the split fights more than anything, um, weren't able to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Very unfortunate for them, but it was nice to see uh, the champs that did come out and out from the fans. We asked you guys what champions you wanted to see in pro play. Remember, you can answer that question using hashtag LCO on Twitter because we got some people who went ahead and did just that. Uh, Kezzy <laughs> said, Rex, I top, Rex, I top. Yes! Did you pay this person, Max? I flamed him, if you remember, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. I do remember this, I do. And now he's coming out with a suggestion that I absolutely love. So, Kezzy, in redeemed. terms of, you have redeemed yourself <laughs> tenfold with this. I love Rex, I top. I think it's only a matter of time until we see it in competitive. Great suggestion. This is how you win over Max's love, guys. You just tweet a Rex, I top there. Uh, <laughs> we'll probably have another one here, too. Uh, some more that we want to see. Need more locks in my life. The debt. That's fair. That is very. I like that one. I wouldn't mind seeing some locks as well. What we need for that to happen is Kyosu to come back into the LCO. Yes. Slams it in the mid lane and just absolutely one v nines with it. And people are like, oh, what on earth is going on here? Or somehow the meta needs to go back to like Caitlyn Lux in the bot lane, mm. and we just completely outrange everybody. Yep. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. No. That meta change, unfortunately. Uh, more likely that we're going to be... Uh, <laughs> seeing a lot more Jinx in the bot lane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, any more from the fans? Let's see uh, what some other champs have been suggested towards us. My queen preferably played with a Yasuo or someone else for some juicy wombo we do want some combo Diana. goodness. Well, Nat, yeah. we have Chiefs game later on, right? Yeah. We have Kevy and we have Kise on the same team. We do. If there's one person who's going to play Diana, it's going to be Kevy. Yeah. But if there's one person that's going to play Yasuo, it's going to be Kise. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to predict anything, but I'm just saying. The, the perfect recipe is brewing, is what we're trying to say. There exactly. is a potential for it. And then Storley just plays the Dana instead yep. and says, yep, I'm the AP wizard as well, mate. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> we do have one more as well from the fans. Uh, they tweeted at us saying... Uh, <laughs> Oh, Wait, is that it's Tim. Carbon? That is Carbon. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why does this look so funny? That skin is actually prestige. <laughs> prestige? Yeah. Amel always coming in uh, clutch with the content there, so. He, and give, he gives you menu log vouchers when he hits his Q yeah. on that skin. <laughs> yeah. How come I haven't gotten any yet? 
You've dodged them all. I've dodged them all. <laughs> You're yeah. too good. You've I'm gonna start walking into them purposely. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, where are you? But that might be that might be the double bluff. You might try and walk into it, and, and from then he's that... still dodging it. That's why he hasn't hit it yet. <laughs> That's why he hasn't hit it. I stand the straight line. He predicts to the side. Oh, you've missed. <laughs> you've missed. You can't even walk into that one there. But we're gonna take a break, a very short break. It's a best of two. So when we come back, we'll still have Vertex and Kanga fighting it out. They're gonna crack this turret. 11,000 gold down, and with the Baron, it's just expired. Vertex still looks to pull the trigger and go for gold. They'll find one with a hook, and they'll take down Jakey very easily. Chaos Storm spreading the burn of the Andres left, right, and center, and they're completely zoned back to their fountain. They have to deal with those snoopers, but that power is gone, as is their base. Against the machine, reveal the people underneath it, put that on like masterpieces, the lexicon of instrumental, deacon of the speakers, a Jewish kid in this rap, like a Mexican with some sprinklers, I get it done better, man I get it done cheaper, give away the product, and I get paid through my sneakers, so when you see the behind the scenes, it's the kind of thing that got you thinking, the new era of terror, come kiss the pinky ring ring, the lights are so bright, it's like heaven on my bling bling, hey yo Verizon, get at me for the sync license, same thing, the mic is prosthetics, when I shred it, give me green green, I'm gonna ball till I fall, gonna ride till I die I'm never giving you if I wanna survive Not gonna swallow my pride I'll never give up cause when it's all said and done Is what I've done enough I push myself to the end, I push myself to the brink Is a toil I'm worth it, it makes me stop and think But through the mud and the mire, the joy and the strife No one can claim that I didn't live all of this beautiful life It's game two between Vertex and Kanga in this best of two. We've talked about everything that went right for Vertex, some of the small openings for Kanga, but ultimately it was the cohesion, the execution that came from Vertex. Is that enough to carry them through essentially what is the weaker side here, the red side Poltrog? Well, I did predict a 1-1. <laughs> I hope Kanga make a comeback on the blue side. Like I said earlier, I think both teams will win on the blue side. It is a lot stronger, and you can probably get that draft you want, right? Mm. Give the B1... You're probably going to get the draft you prepped. Red side, who knows? You have to prep. Oh, are Vertex going to be one this? Are they going to be one that? It's harder. Mm. A lot to prepare for. 
yeah, there's, there's a lot of different opportunities, different ways that it can go. But if you guys subscribe to what Poltron is selling here, that blue side's so much stronger that they're going to go 1-1. One, one. Then put your dare fan vote in all the way in that top corner over there. That way we keep going. Yeah, right there. Right there. <laughs> and you could say that that would mean uh, we're in for a Kanga win. That's what we can look forward to, Skim, if you're a Kanga fan. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm hoping it goes that way, just because our predictions, first of all. All four of us. That is the most yep. important thing. <laughs> uh, Rusty is wrong, so just like his uh, okay. what champion you want to see, that's two L's in one night, <laughs> may I just say. That's why you're not sitting on the couch here, G. Uh, also, I do think uh, Fighters probably got some more tricks up his sleeve. So I'm feeling like, you know, he could get a little <laughs> bit spicier. Maybe he goes something standard, right? Like maybe just like slams like an Azir or Corky or... Or something along those lines, right? But if he goes even deeper into the sort of like watch something, mysteries, I was like gonna Vex, say, watch yes something cooked like, like Nico get through or something like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I love how the standard when we talk about standard with Fido, it's like Azir and Corky. Like that's his standard, but well, it's so far like it's so he, left standard. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. his standard. It's just the Fido standard. Mm -hmm. the, the the next thing that happens after us talking about side select, their fan vote is the standard champ select, which <gasps> is now ready. Beautiful, Nat. Let's uh, crack on with this one today, Max. Let's see what happens in game number two. Nico is banned away straight away by Vertex, so no chance for Kanga to pick that up in their first rotation. But they take away two big AP threats. They remove, first of all, the Gwen, Aww. as well as the Syndra. That is a fluffy dog. He is definitely going to be warm right now. I feel like Jake's trying to get out all the dare fan votes in their favor. Yeah. It's a bit foul play, isn't it? No, that is, that is a kindness. tampering. I would say. I would say so. Our officials need to look into that. Referee do need to be on that one very quickly. The Azir has been banned away, as has the Victor. So, I mean, every champion is AP. It's just been taken off the board here. Really is going to try and limit that champion pool. And to my eyes, it's almost like Fido laying down the gauntlet saying, all right, Chirp, mate, how deep does it go? Like, how, how far can you contest me? Absolutely. And with the removal of the Syndra and the Victor, it opens up a potential Casio, right? Obviously, blue siding Casio is a bit harder because you don't have... The, the benefit of having it hidden. But Fido has been known to just blind pick this if yeah. he feels like it is a good uh, game for it. So that's something I'm looking towards. In terms of first pick, does Shinky play the Kisante? They haven't had the highest priority on it on their previous games. Really, anything's up in the air. Jinx of Failure is still open. Zeri actually making it through draft. And oh my god, Skimmy. We forgot. We've been so mind controlled by the fact that all these AP champions are removed. For the first time, it's taken three weeks. Milio's been locked in, Kangaroo going 1-1. I just assumed it was auto-banned. It, it's been banned that much. I didn't We're not even, even looking. I didn't even We're think even about it. I just assumed that Red Side had banned it, but that's going to be Milio coming through. So this opens up a whole new avenue for the bot lane, right? You can pick something like a Lucian. You can play something like a Jinx and then have a billion range to go along with it. We might even be getting a Zeri Yumi potentially coming out. This opens so many different opportunities for draft that we haven't yet seen in this region. And this would be the most exciting draft we've seen in such a long time, right? Two old guards in both Jakey and Rosie showcasing, hey, let's just play some enchanters. Let's just have a bit of fun. Let's run it back like it's 2015 all over again. Um, and, uh, you know, really give the viewers something at home to, to really enjoy as opposed to saying, guys, why doesn't my region play what the rest of the world is doing? Exactly. We are really advancing, taking leaps and <laughs> bounds forwards here as a region. Now, I really want to see a Lucian. Lucian played internationally with this Milio is just basically like the Lucian Nami 2.0 where you sprint to that and there it is. Thank you, boys. <laughs> and it's the Casio. It's Exodia. It's Exodia for Kanga. Really couldn't ask for much more. Wow, what a strong start here from the side of Kanga and Blue side to really showcase that, hey, you've uh, denied so many pocket picks that you've left up so many potential strength points that uh, we're going to really look to try and exploit now. Question really becomes for Chirp if he is hovering a mid lane champion. Where would they go? What would it be? Would it be a delivery system like an Oriano with a Vi? Would it be something a little bit standard? Is that the best response to Casio here is the question mark? Ori Casio, if you look back at, you know, 2015, even 2016, a very common mid lane matchup between these two champions. Oriana obviously having a bit of range advantage, able to get that ball out and really create uh, a zone where Casio struggles to walk, especially like you mentioned with that Vi being able to come in and gank once at level 6 comes through, mm -hmm. makes Casio's life a living hell. That being said, you do have this Lucian and if there's any champion that can really play out of Oriana's range with something like a culling, dashing forward, really cutting her down, it's going to be that character. So to me, this is a battle of, there's so many new champions, which team is more comfortable, which team is more familiar and is able to put together a more cohesive comp. But I guess the question now becomes, how do these top laners influence the rest of the map? Because we saw Thomas Dina have arguably his best game of the, the league so far um, on the Cassante. Should be feeling quite comfortable into Shinki, you'd have to imagine. They've actually denied over the Scions, some of the Comfort Champions. 
Do they feel the necessity to remove away any enchanters? You probably wouldn't think so. I wouldn't be amiss if he were to try and go, you know, full team fight esque, you know, slam something like a cannon again, mm. uh, and just try and say, look, you know, we're going to take over this game before the Lucian Milio really ramps up. Yeah, so the, the band's very smart there, taking away those two answers into Milio to try to match it scaling wise. You don't want to allow something like a Zero Yumi, I think, is honestly just the most broken bot lane in the game right now. Lulu, kind of in that same vein, just scales up alongside it, has a lot of utility with that vibe providing a frontline avenue to get like a massive wild growth or something that being said Cassante open for Tomasino had a great performance on a previous game and it's going to be Nautilus yep so th this has been a pick that's been seen into Milio obviously Milio with that super mega fire kick able to negate a lot of the engage if it's timed correctly that being said there is a big emphasis on execution there. What 100%. It's like some of the buffering that we see in interactions you know Leona Fresh for instance uh, a few others in terms of how the supports can really play to uh, showcase their uh, excellence in the role. Uh, but I have to say that Rosie looked flawless on the Nautilus for the most part. I mean, yes, you could critique that time when they had the, the flash off the flash single file affair, but he was chucking uh, hooks on cooldown. He was landing depth charges, really uh, had such killer Ooh. conviction. As Kanga are now going to lock in the Orn for a second time in a row and are currently now hovering a Kindred. Yeah, this would be interesting. I kind of like this because it provides so much peel back and it's going to be locked in. It provides so much peel back for the Vi Oriana combo, right? Sure, you can ult someone, one person, but if that's not the Kindred, she's just going to be chucking that ultimate on on top of whoever that is. Yeah. And especially with builds as well, right? The Trinity Force coming into popularity as the leading Kindred build. You are a bruiser, essentially, right? You're a ranged bruiser who's able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these champions. So a lot of sustained damage and oh my god. What year are we? What is this? What is this draft? This is the best draft we've seen in the entirety of LCO. It's going to be Camille for Tomasino saying, I'm not going to take a back seat this game. I want to carry. I absolutely want to carry. This is like a champion that's close to home for you. I know more than anybody um, on the couch here, but it's been such a long time since we've seen the Camille. It's been such a long time since we've seen a, a big emphasis on playing towards side lanes and sort of macro pressure because it almost feels like Ost has fallen into a bit of a trap where it's five or five or bust. So here's the question for me, Skimmy, coming into this draft. Vertex has the Camille, has the Vi, has the Oriana. Zeri as well can get involved. It's a very dive heavy comp right and then you look at Kanga they have a lot of tools to deal with that so it's really going to come down to can Vertex execute explosively enough to you know blow up this Cassio blow up this Kindred before something like the Milio can peel before the Kindred ulti can come down because if they don't there's so much sustained damage that Kanga will win the fight in the long term. Well I just think in terms of uh, both Milio and Kindred's ultimates their uh, timings are of the most importance more than anything right now the ability to keep your teammate both cleansed uh, and, and healthy, alive, immune, really to the damage diving threats of a, a Vi and a Camille running at you. Uh, I, I don't envy the position they find themselves in right now because as strong as it is, uh, they've definitely got to have to have a, a bit of restraint as to, you know, is this the right moment to burn those cooldowns? And I feel like you can at times get a little bit paralyzed by trying to seek out too much value by getting the, uh, the full duration or, or, the, or the best moment. Yeah, absolutely going to have to be looking at that Milio ulti zero comes out. I'm just so excited to see this champion in the LCO, really. Like, we haven't seen it at all. We know that with the Lucian pairing provides so much burst damage. As we take a look at the comps once again, Camille into Orn, a matchup that, you know, typically Camille struggles with a little bit in lane, but like every single Camille matchup ever, you reach your Mythic and you start winning. Divine Sundra probably going to be what's coming out for Tomasino here. And he's going to be a real split push threat, right? So if we do look at the later stages of the game, if we are able to get a matchup in the side lane, that could be an avenue where Tomasino could look to attack and could look to be the difference maker for Vertex. On a side of Kangado, this is going to be the 18th game played by Fighter of Cassiopeia's most successful champion by a country mile, averaging a 65% win rate. It's the reason why when you Ooh. see it locked in, it just tends to win. It's just a little bit too strong and nobody else is playing it. So this really is the battle of how strong truly is Blue Side? Well, you've literally got everything you could ask for. You really do, and it speaks to his confidence as well. We mentioned that he, he's just blind pick it. You don't see that in any other region in the world, right? No one else is just blind picking Cassio like Fido is, but no one else is carrying his games to the extent that Fido is on something like this Cassiopeia. So really looking at a nice, well-rounded scaling composition for the side of Kanga, whereas the onus is a bit more on Vertex to get stuff done in the early game, in the mid game, to really snowball and accelerate the game before Kanga can catch up. So let's talk about this bot lane, obviously because the Milia is into effect and has basically uh, substituted out the Nami. Obviously Nami was such a great pairing with uh, 
at Lucian for such a long time. Similar fact, obviously the Enchanter, the buff, the Cozy Campfire, all the sort of ability to proc that damage off even more so than what Anami could offer. Yeah, Cozy Campfire, Warm Hugs, and I'd say the main difference between the Milio and the Nami is the defensive capacity of the Milio is slightly higher, right? With that super mega fire kick, with the Breath of Life, able to provide a fair amount of peel, um, in addition to the shielding that you provide off your E, the extra range off your W, just a bit of a safer pick as opposed to Nami, who is really, really vulnerable in her own right. So it is going to be coming down to Jake, obviously a newer player, pilot, an older player, sorry, player piloting a newer champion, and Mayfan getting active on this Kindred early. It will be found out though, Forever's here. Yeah, Forever's on the ray right now, as is Rosie. If they can make a play happen right now, this will be disastrous for him. Jakey's gonna rock up, say, here, have a shield. Is that enough? A flash away, but Forever's on the Ooh. hunt, on the prowl, wanting to kill. Summon a heal, comes out, Forever's been denied! And they thought they had to jump, but then Lucian gets first blood. That's best case scenario for Kanga. That is a tragedy for Vertex. They read the play, they knew the invade was coming, but they're just not able to execute. Walking away one auto attack from death is Mayfan. But again, it just seems like whichever bot lane's pushing is able to move, able to help rotate and get that jungler ahead. And it's just easy pickings from there. Oh, so frustrating though it must be, especially for Rosie. They feel like he's done everything he possibly could there with the flash, the hook, the ignite, the guaranteed kill. Summon a hill, just a little bit too clutch. Yeah, and he plays it well, right? He gets the flash auto attack, guarantees that hook is gonna land. The flash coming out and it's crucially that last auto attack not able to land heal like you mentioned coming through providing that bit of extra movement speed and that's got to hurt i do even believe that the smite came through for may finally get got that blue buff in the end of it so it's just a disaster for the side of forever yeah, it certainly is and the gold has gone in all the right places if you're a kanga fan right now your bot lane is on the board an early game powerhouse and a kindred that wants to get marks asap that is actually gone for the carry potential that might now be wrapping around with double buffs to try and put some pressure onto Chirp. He's going to jump into effect. He's going to receive the uh, dissonance and be told, go away. Once again, the bot lane being the difference maker, though, is here comes Voice. Not going to be anything more than a chunk, but Mayfun is really getting what he wants in this early game, right? I mean, he gets the kill, gets the assist, rather, on that first play, then walks right into the Raptor camp. He doesn't even have mid prior, right? So in a world, there is that Chirp able to walk up and contest that camp, but just taking advantage of that opportunity where there is a window to get that camp and Mayfan, a really great start for this Kindred. So he is, it's all we could hope for and it gives uh, just so much uh, pressure relieved off a of Fighter in the sense that, you know, we know how good he is on this champion, but looking at how they performed in game one, it really was him against the world. And it has felt like that narrative for the best part of a year in some of the rosters that he's been with, right? So it's great to see the rest of the team um, show signs of life this early on to bounce back and say that, you know, game one, didn't play too well, we dust that one off, we go again. Yeah, absolutely. Their ability to bounce back is huge. As we take another look at this bot lane here, potentially the biggest source of action for the side of Vertex, right? Dante on this Zeri, wanting to get ahead, wanting to get advantages. If you just let this lane play out naturally in the Lucian Milio, they are just going to win the lane, right? They are going to be able to stack ways, they are going to be able to put pressure on your turret. As we can see here though, Vertex doing a good job of pressuring them, making sure they're not able to crash this waves and have a free time with the lane. Fighter, they're gonna be completely zoned back. Very defensively under his own tower. He's gonna have to use a TP to get back to that one to make sure that nothing is lost, but Vertex are on the hunt. Whether or not they were staying around for a little bit longer was forever. I was curious to see if they try and force anything, but they're gonna utilize that timing to go back as well. I've also got my eyes very firmly fixated on Tomasina. How does Camille can come into effect, right? Because as you mentioned, one item, you start to feel strong. Two item, you've got even better wave clear. Suddenly from that point onwards, side lanes are a big issue. Yeah, there definitely is. And obviously doing a good job so far of staving off the bit of extra early game power. That's something like an Ornn provides. Realistically, if you're staying even as Camille, you are feeling pretty decent. You can obviously look for plays to link up with your jungler. As here we go, once again, it's a repeat for Kanga. They get this bot lane prior, they move their support up, and Mayfan, what is that Q playing so aggressively? Wow. He knows he can do whatever he wants. The fact he wasn't punished for that, literally in their face saying, come at me, boys, I do not care whatsoever. I've been relentless from the very get-go in this game by diving as well as kind of jungling. I want that mark, I'll get that mark. That's number three, only six minutes in. This is huge though, and Kanga consistently using their bot lane to springboard the Kindred even further ahead. Three marks at this point in the game with only one kill going down. Transitioning to a dragon as well, Skimmy. 
really showing that this Lucian Milio can lend so much power not only to their lane but to the rest of the map. Pretty curious to see what build Mayfine actually goes for as well because I believe we've seen Trinity Force as well as we saw Gale Force come out from Kevy. Um, so really pick your poison as to what's going to feel more valuable. Do you need the extra mobility, the execute potential, or do you need the uh, more bruises to sustain, as you already mentioned as well for the uptime on that damage. Mayfun obviously get a transition, that pressure that he can find uh, from counter jungling, but from his bot lane to guarantee that they get the first dragon. He is top lane. As we now turn to the top lane, and the hexagon item goes out into effect. They flash across and say, Shinky, where are you going? Everybody burning it, and Shinky's out! The Great Escape! Wow, that was really well played by Shinky. Using the ultimate there, threatening a potential kill into Tomasino if that second part of the Ornhorde lands makes him have to flash, and then Shinky flashes out. That is not a play you're expecting from a rookie top laner, right? But not only does he get out, has the TP to come back as well, so doesn't lose anything off the back of it. A great play from a very inexperienced player. Yeah, shows a uh, great peace of mind to not fall victim to maybe an unfamiliar situation. Clearly uh, well drilled and how he wants to try and play this one and not fall victim to anything crazy at this start, even if it was some jungle pressure. As we go on then into the bot lane and they look to try and make sure that the solution will not get too excited that the Zeri can actually answer back with potential of their own. And once again, it's Rosie starting it up. Yeah, I, I want to know how that happened because it really feels like Voice just got caught off automating a control ward, got hooked and taken down. But that's a mistake you can't afford to be making. Your support has roamed or based, not able to pr help there. On the other side of the map, though, Kanga are going to direct their attention towards this Rift Herald. They have a very strong topside 3v3 with that Cassio ultimate and with that Ornn online. Supports up here as well. It's looking like they want to fight for this objective. Certainly seems to be the case right now. Four members here nice and early with uh, Voice hovering in the mid lane as well to keep attendance towards Chirp. That is the consideration we need to make around these big fights as such that they can definitely engage with a Shockwave on a Nautilus or a Vi. I guarantee that multiple members are locked in place. No level 6 right now for Nemilio. Will not have the ability to cleanse them all out. As in they jump, they actually steal it away, does forever. Then tries to isolate eight Mayfun. Lamps of Spike goes down. Mayfun across the wall, jumps to try and safety, but Thomas Fino's come across the wall with a hook shot which cannot connect. Cannot do the damage. So now they're going to answer back. Yes, you'll get the Herald, but will we get kills? We found one, and they're going to be lucky just to not find more. And it will be Vertex getting the Herald, but the fight goes definitely against them. They're not able to land that clean combo with the Lamb's Respite coming out, saving Mayfun, and it's ultimately a bit disjointed. You see Tomasino flying over the wall, Chirp's Shockwave only finding one member, and if you're not able to find that clean engage, like we mentioned, it's the DPS gap for the side of Kanga. It certainly is. It's a bit of a rough one. Let's run it back without it all started off because it's Kanga that gets the jump nice and early. Yeah, absolutely. So once again, we see a bit of a fight. Both jungles wanting to smite this. It does going end up going over to Forever, but it's this Lamb's Rest by. There's sort of a fight within a fight where Tomasino wants to get involved, but look how low he is when he jumps over this wall because he's been fighting Fido. Ends up going down basically straight away, and then from there, it really is just a matter of cleanup for Kanga. And I don't think Tomasino really had anything else in mind at a one for one, at least a trade of his life, given how low he was already. The culling goes out, and Chirp goes down. Another curious effect as to how that all started, but clearly the killer instinct to make it work. Yeah, well, this just proves that you cannot be in a long lane versus Lucian Milio, because you will get run down with the culling much akin to what would happen with the Nami. You realistically are just a sitting duck, especially as an Orianna with no flash. And this Lucian, having completed the Kraken Slayer now, sitting very pretty with a lot of damage and burst potential available. I mean, it just gives you flashbacks to the days of old, right? When you had uh, Rapid Fire Cannon with the Gale Force, you just one shot somebody from a million miles away. You're thinking, how is that balanced? How is that fair? Uh, I'm sure we'll get a, a chance for an indication of it looking like that as well in this game. But opting for the Kraken Slayer first and foremost obviously makes life a lot easier. Uh, for shredding through some of these very tanky targets, and there's a fair few in this game. Absolutely, a lot of burst as well, with it being changed to extra physical damage, able to really rip through any target, get that milio auto attack, that double tap as well, the Lucian is so prolific. You combine that with the Presti attack, and you have so much burst in your, in your arsenal. And realistically, the question to me is, what are Vertex fighting for? What are they willing to put pressure on? Because right now, this bot lane, they don't have the Herald. They do need to look out for a potential trade back with that objective. But right now, anywhere they go, they can just get priority. And that they do once again. Mayfun really hovering towards this bot lane there to protect and there to empower more than anything. They know that they are the star of the show. Mayfun could be caught out here. But needs to be careful. He's going to juggle the aggro. Oh, look at that. He doesn't even jump across the wall. He says, you can't catch me. You can't kill me. No but now they can. A flash across the wall to try and get to safety. 
Feels a little bit disrespectful, honestly. He had a chance to get across the wall, but then sidesteps it. Yeah, he's been playing disrespectful all game, and there he finally gets punished for it, having to use the flash. The Lambs respite about a 10 to 15 second cooldown left once he was in that position, so not able to use that to survive. But, you know, ultimately, he's right back at it as well, not even basing off the end of that. Wants to stay around, wants to get the gold for that Triforce, and Hextech Dragon is alive. Yeah, it certainly is, and Forever's the only one here at the moment looking to try and put any kind of contest towards this one. Worth noting also, quietly, uh, he's got a very different build, actually rushing the Humble Glaive. Yeah, I mean, that is that is very atypical for the Vi. Obviously, Vi is not a champion who's uh, averse to getting that early damage that a uh, Lethality item provides, but it makes you so squishy. Mm. If you mess up an ultimate, if you land, if you ultimate a Lucian and he dashes back into his team, you are just going to get one shot even quicker than we saw from Mayfun in the previous game. So it, the response is going to be the Herald getting dropped, trying to get some gold back onto Dante. But Mayfun's here, this is a 3v3. Another voice though jumps in. Oh, the flash away, but it's buffed beautifully. Get Rosie still guarantees it. Is it enough to keep him topped up and healthy? The Lamb's Respite is there, as you see, and that was enough to get him out of a very sticky Whoa. situation. They want more. Mayfun is really just playing on the edge of insanity, and Dante says, you can't disrespect me. Yes, you got Milio. Yes, Revolution. But don't forget, it's Zeri, and that champion is just as broken. Now, everybody is low, and a turret dive would seem crazy, but they're going to show a bit of restraint. I mean, you're thinking, surely not, but the way this game has been going, it really seems like either team will go for anything. Someone needs to tell the players on Kanga to stop using their dashes so offensively. As we take a look at how this play starts again, wanting to contest the Herald, his voice flashes, ease forwards and then flashes backwards, but still gets hit by the hook. The Lamb's Respite is crucial in keeping them alive. But look at Dante, basically untouched in this fight, having the Zeri ultimate still on his uptime here. And Mayfun, dashing forward, no ultimate, just gets taken down, really disrespecting the damage that Vertex provide. Maybe feeling a little bit too overconfident with the composition that they have, that they can just take any fight they please and aren't going to be too punished for it. But Vertex, not a team to mess around with today, especially. We've seen how pumped up and ready they were to go in game number one. And this game is far from over. A very close affair as the turret plates are about to fall on down. 40 minutes is very much fast approaching. That's kind of clever from Tomasino using uh, the pillar there from the Yawn. But just to get back to lane. Second Dragon is up, as you already mentioned, minutes ago. But this time, it's being looked at here by Vertex. Yeah, it looks like he's just going to be taken down. It's very hard for Kindred to play in these fights without the Lamb's Respite, especially against the Vi. You get hit with that Cease and Desist, you are just going to get taken down. So there is going to be a trade back for Vertex, and Ornhorn's coming out mid lane. Chirp has Flash. It is on. He's flashed into it. It doesn't matter, though, because nobody was there from Kanga to back up that play just slightly too early. Had to make it happen at that moment, though. It wasn't really any other choice. And there is that Flash and that Cease and Desist. There is the double ultimate banger. And Dante punishes a lonely Lucian. Kills are going right where you want them. If you're Vertex, you're down one kill, but up almost a thousand gold, and all of it's right where you want it. It's on this Derry, who is now sitting with the Triforce completed. Dante had a blinder in game one, and looking to replicate that here in game two. That he certainly is, saying it doesn't really matter if you've got the Exodia draft, if you're going to showcase a debuting on a broken brand new champion like Milio. Zeri's still there, been here for a much longer time, and is ever so strong before it does get nerfed in a future patch. And they're going to use it quite handily here to put themselves into the driving seat now. They've actually managed to get a turret as a result of that dive. Trade back for Kanga will be looking at this uh, Herald now. And here's a little mini game that's sort of been happening inside this game is whose ultimates are up for a potential Herald fight, for a potential Dragon fight. We saw the Dragon earlier going over to Vertex because Kanga didn't have the Lamb's Respite, didn't have the ability to contest. A similar story, but on the opposite side here for this Rift Herald, right? No Cease and Desist, no Zeri Ultimate. You're not wanting to take that fight where you could potentially lose because of that deficit. So it's just going to be trades on either side of the map. The question to me is, where are you putting this Herald, right? Fido has been quietly achieving this game. 0-0-1 zero, zero, and one, has the Rod of Ages, almost a completed tier as well. So you're going to be feeling quite good. If it's me, you want to get this Lucian a bit more ahead. He's not sitting right where he wants to. Lucian in a game with Milio needs to be the one who has so much damage that can be providing that real burst. 100% you want them to be the mid-game bullies, right, where they can be planted in uh, in the mid lane in particular uh, to force those 2v2s to guarantee more structures are falling on down, that nobody like Azeri can step up with that amount of agency because right now they're doing just that. They are flexing the map uh, and going all over the show to say we'll answer back and, uh, you know, continue to make this gold lead even more desirable for us right now. You can see already up by a full 1,000 gold as the fight takes place in the mid lane. Everything being chucked towards Chirp. No chance to run away from that one. Didn't even have a flash anyway. 
but it is a guaranteed kill. There's a bit of exchange happens in the top lane here as well. Was Kango trying to answer back and prevent another outer from falling? But Shinki is playing with the experience almost beyond his years, right? We've seen him, this is the second time in as many minutes that he's walked up to mid lane, thrown that ultimate out, burns a flash the first time, gets a kill now, and that is realistically all you can do as Orn in this situation, right? You catch the wave into the Camille when you can, you find the opportunities to link with your team and get your teammates advantages, and he's executing on these win conditions and kind of running laps around Tomasino, who we thought was going to have the advantage in this matchup. 100%. He does have the Divine Thunder now, and he's certainly working his way towards uh, some of that side lane split push potential, but really looking forward to that second item spike when the Cleaver comes online, be it the... Um Ravenous Hydra or the Titanic Hydra, one of those two variants to really make sure that, yeah, waves do not exist. And if Orn does continue to group up with the rest of the team, hey, there's always going to be that trade-off. It's yeah. your base for a Baron or your base for a big fight. Absolutely. Always going to take that Nexus for Elder Trade any day of the week. To me, the question is, what is Tomasino going to look to do on those rotations, right? Because if we are at a stage where Shinky is able to shove out the waves, able to catch them as a ghost pop from Dante, that might have been a misclick. It never really looked like a world in which that kill was on, did it? I think he was a bit scared that a few more members from the side of Kanga were going to show up, so prompts, pops it preemptively. That being said, though, this mid lane is such a point of contention from either team, right? On the one hand, there goes the Camille. Yeah, Boyce has jumped in, Shockwave on his head as well, and he the Lambs respite, but it's too little, too late. Mayfun jumps in a little bit too late to the fight. He's going to answer back and say, you will not take him down for free, and Tomasino is to be removed now. A one for one, as easy as it is. No objective up just yet. We're going to ping these uh, towers instead as a result. It's a good play from the side of Vertex, and on more fronts than one is hold on, Skimmy. We're not done skirmishing. They're going to bully out forever from his own jungle, as they will look to try and take as much as they can from the side of Vertex as they transition their pressure towards the top lane. Big wave stacked up and guarantee their second to match Vertex. Yeah, I lied. We are done skirmishing, but Tomasino Getting the kill in that situation is great, but also what's even better is the double TPs invested on the side of Kanga, right? We're talking about Camille wanting to make these plays, these split push positions, and able to really put pressure on those turrets. If you don't have TPs and Orn, you have to walk to plays or you're going to be second to them, right? On that case, you give the turret up to Camille. So creates a lot of opportunities for Camille to get work done in this 260 second cooldown where the TPs aren't available. 100% as you quite rightly point out, the fact that Thomas Sinner is the only one right now that has a TP available to them, would love to see them look to try and play towards those lanes and not perhaps fall victim to the, you know, the beautiful bait dance of, hey, we're going for this objective, force the TP out, completely retract. What is his Vi build, by the way? We've got an Umbral Glaive. We're going into uncharted territory here is what we're going into. <laughs> Skimmy. As we see the dragon getting started up here, Tomasino has decided to walk. This is going to be a 5v5. Keep in mind Kindred ultimate available, Cassiopeia ultimate available. We're going to need to see a flank from Tomasino. Tomasino is grouped up with the rest of the team. This will be our first indication of the true potential of both squads at 20 minutes in. Out goes the call of the Forge Gods. The dragon's still being looked at, but Forever steals it away for the second time in a row. Three man shockwave in, jumps by, down and deleted. Fido finds his first of the game. That's what you need. The culling zones them back. The Miasma, enough to try and keep them interested. And Tomasino still working on the flank right now with a Hextic Ultimatum, but a hook shot to run away. It was a massive shockwave from Chirp there. Three members taken very low off the back of that, but Kanga somehow still stabilizing. And it's Tomasino not wanting to get involved, not wanting to go. He's on the backside. Wow. Mayfun's taking that Chirp. You'd really have to wonder what's going on there. The fact that they've just had such a successful fight and just reset away from the rest of the team. You can only imagine right now, Mayfun really has nothing left in the arsenal. No ultimate, had a flash, but really how are you going to run away from a Nautilus as well as a uh, Camel? There's certainly no running there. Going to be picked up off the back end as we take a look at this fight again. So it starts off with Kanga pulling the trigger, noting that there are only three members of Vertex in the river. It's an initial decent on horn, but the shockwave is massive. Finds three, but look how squishy Forever is. He goes to the back line and is instantly blown up. Here, Tomasino potentially has a window to enter, but decides against it. Decides he doesn't want to risk his own life because if he goes into that fight, he is surely dead. He certainly is. Could have maybe picked off a straggler there, but just not worth it. That has been his uh, downfall in the previous fight. Ah, yeah, just made fun. On a keen eye to just try and punish. Chirp separated from the rest of the herd. And just picked apart, really. May fun. Really good this game at finding these cheeky windows of opportunity. Does get taken down here later on as he decides to take the wolf camp, really feeling himself. Gets it in the end, so, you know, not the least worth thing in the world, but 
Ultimately, Tomasino getting a bit more gold, able to complete that Ravenous Hydra, and is now looking like a significant split push threat. It certainly is. That's when it gets really exciting for the Camille play, right? As to how you can utilize your advantages on the map, be it the pressure, be it the TP uh, uses. Oh no. Was it the Gromp or the blue buff that reset? Something reset, I saw it. <laughs> I had I had a worry there for a second. Is Rosie? Well, I held my breath there for you in anticipation, but nothing were to come of it. Rosie is forced to burn that flash. Isn't going to be too worse to wear, though. Does have the Hex Flash available. But look at this, right? This is the trade. Anytime that Kanga wants to go for a play like that, bring on up, it opens a window for Tomasino. And Camille, at this point in the game, does not need very long alone with these turrets to get a kill. That being said, Mayfun's here. Yeah, what can they do in a 1v2? He instantly just jumps across to Mayfun and says, I'm not interested in fighting Shinky. I'll lock you in place with the Hexagon and made him. I'll counteract that with an ultimate of my own. DPS threat, you're low. I'm flashing away. Deny the potential of the Camille execute. And Shinky says, let's just end this. And that they do, a shutdown is found. Transition that attention oh. towards the mid lane right now. Look to try and take down Fido, who's gone for the petrifying gaze, but not enough to stand and deliver in front of four strong members of Vertex. Dante removes voice. Who never really stood a chance to hit the culling, and that was that. Mayfun now putting another shot, then removing the crucial carry in the Zeri. Dante's removed, make it another double. As the, I mean, the Kindred really at this stage is stronger than the Lucian. Kindred is running amok here, and this is the benefit of having this triple DPS comp. One goes down, the other one just steps up here. Fido initially using the flash, still getting hit by that depth charge and going down. Voice as well, but like you said off the back end, this is a Kindred who's got Witsend, who's got the Trinity Force, is no slouch by any means, and she's found Chirp again. Unbelievable. Just do three. You hit the go button, Shrill is, you jump across the wall and say hello. I mean, what are you going to do? You're 0-4 now. And there's a TP on Cassio. There's a world in which they just start this Baron, and that's exactly what they're going to do here. Chirp is down. There's no Zeri ultimate either. This Vi is so squishy that if she goes in at even the wrong millisecond, she's going to get one shot. He stole on two objectives this game so far, Max. Could this be the hero play? Could he find... Objective steal and number three in a squishy Vi build. It's going to be forced away very early here by Mayfun. Jumping back into the pit. Are they going to make this a 50-50? I dare believe it. As they Go jump in with Tomasino, it. they found Jake. The Baron is down to 2600. Getting closer and closer to the smite range right now. 2k. 20! Oh. 20 HP! It was so close forever! I commend you for the attempt. Unbelievable. But Mayfun is guaranteed it for his team. And it's now 9-2. and two. My heart was beating like crazy there. As we take another look at the play that starts it all on the bot side of the map, it is Tomasino getting a bit feisty here towards Mayfun. Does end up going down, but it's what happens on the other side of the map that is so crucial. While this is all happening, Vertex are capitalizing, finding Fido, finding Voice, getting these kills. It looks good at the start, but ultimately it's Mayfun rocking up, making plays on the bot side, getting towards his top side, and he goes unchecked here. They don't think he's a threat, but he picks up the kill on Dante, picks up the kill on Forever, and he is just unchecked in this fight. So much range now at this point. I'd love to see how many marks he has because it just looks unbelievable across the walls sniping you from such a far away. Nine marks. I mean, really is the star of the show right now. And yes, the Lucian hasn't really worked out as cleanly as they would have wanted to, but they don't have to worry as much. You already mentioned it. Three major DPS threats and Emilio there to buff them all. Absolutely. And I'd like to shout out forever for potentially the worst Vi build we've ever seen in the LCO. <laughs> Umbral Glaive Evan Shroud. I can see the theory behind it, but in a game like this, you are just so squishy and you just die. That's basically the story of the game. Basically, he's just a ball delivery system for the Orianna at this stage. And if we're really looking at ways for Vertex to get back into this game, it's that Zeri right there on your screen. Three items, a Titanic Hydra, Rune and Trinity Force, but here comes the Ornhorn. It certainly is. Beautifully buffered there by Rosie to get to safety as they will have to concede their base and the structures within it. Base turret number one goes on down, as does this bot lane inhibitor at 25 minutes into this game. And it's all about that picture in picture. What can Tomasino do whilst the siege continues? He's going to try and work his way to try and find a turret of his own. But I think Kanga needs to really consider what is the play. Do we go back to base or do we fight to end? And that's a mini win there for the side of Vertex, right? They get the Ornalty, doesn't kill anyone. They force two bases. That temporarily stems the bleeding, allows them a bit of time to catch waves and really reset their tempo. But Dante, he doesn't want to reset anything. He's going for a fight. Oh my god, Dante's played this beautifully, completely baited Mayfun to try and take the fight. The cease relaying is perfect. A cease and desist into a knockout from the depth charge. Okay. And there's a shutdown. Dante is ice skating on them and gets a double kill. The injection of power of a brand new member that's been around and shown just how good he is. And he's saying, I refuse to lose. Dante is looking like the most valuable roster change of this entire split so far. Having an absolute blinder, taking out Mayfun, like you mentioned, playing at that range, 
Bates may find into thinking that he can kill him and just kites him. That ghost, that lightning crash moving speed proving too invaluable. And now this is a 6 and 1 Zeri. Yes, the rest of his team is behind, but we take a look at it again. Dash is in his face. A lot of disrespectful dashing in this game, but Dante, his mechanics are just too precise. But they certainly are. The CC you're learning, just too much to try and bear there. Lambs just fight, not going to be enough to try and get yourself out of harm's way. And at this point, Jake oh. is completely one banged. Yeah, he, uh, he just pops it, almost getting hit like an orb there to the head, just taken out immediately. And we can look at the gold now 3,000 gold up over voice. Dante is certainly no slouch. Give me the gold is within 1k. But look how strong Dante is, right? The most fed in this entire game. Really does have the world at his feet as to can you carry this game. But it's not to forget the fact that those ornaments are starting to come on through now, being shared across the team. That does still feel like a very even game, if not still Kanga favoured. Yeah, definitely not going to be disrespecting Kanga anytime soon with this Cassio who's sitting at level 15. The second highest member on Vertex is 14. Is a 15 Oriana, but apart from that, there's no one even close to Fido in terms of XP. And anyone jumps on him, a Camille gets on top of him and gets a bit too far in the back line, they're just getting one shot. So it's really going to require a cohesive, well timed execution as Kanga's planning something on, May on Dante here. Yeah, but he's squared it out. He's thinking this looks a little bit too good to be true. But hey, that's a season 13 champion. Yep. He can just run away and says, ah, nice try. Yeah, no worries. Didn't didn't want to provide any opportunities for counterplay anyway. So he's just going to skate over that wall as Kanga once again. Yes, they stumbled a little bit, but they are the ones still in control of this game. Baron and Dragon spawning in two minutes. You do have to imagine Baron going to be the focus, particularly this bot in here broken provides a source of passive pressure for them to group up and pressure this objective. My question becomes though, a max level Cassiope, one of the scariest prospects in the entirety of League of Legends, right? The face checking of a bush where a petrifying gaze comes out, your whole team's dead, right? Max level, bang, gone. The question is, Thomasin is fully invested into the split push deck, right? He's gone for the hole breaker. He does not want to group up. So it's like, how does these Baron effects really come into fruition? Are you just going to lose a Baron fight and say, I've got an inhibitor guys, I'm split pushing for the win. It's a, a big question mark now. Yeah, absolutely. If Vertex can even stall, right? Not even win a fight but just stall and bait time for Thomasino to get work done in the side lane, he certainly can. That being said, if it is Fido contesting him, he goes forever. Here to go, to look for the voice, they want to remove him nice and early. Breath of Life still being held on for, for the moment time. Shinky is going to try and get it with Dante, who preemptively flashes away, so he does not get headbutt and knocked on up. So, someone is burnt, all for the potential of a minute brewing before two major objectives spawn. And you can see the respect that both teams are playing with, right? The TP coming in from Fido and Tomasino, respectively. Neither team wants to have that opportunity where it is a 4v5, where they're caught unawares. And realistically, with Tomasino's TP being used, that means he's going to have to stay around this area for a potential Baron fight. What if I like this is a massive win for Kanga, then? You've taken him away from the split push. You've uh, not got any lanes that you need to really worry about, especially the bot lane in particular, where the super minions are going to continue to add on up and put pressure onto Vertex to have to go back to base, as you can see Chirp doing currently. But level 18, not too far away now. A couple of minion ways to Fido. He's there and done. And might just one-shot somebody like Azeri. Yeah, definitely has the damage to be able to do that. Tomasino cutting the wave. But as you look at this Baron Skimmy, you have a Cassio, Kindred, and a Lucian. All these champions combined basically one-shot this Baron. So you really can't afford any alone time if you're Vertex with this Baron. Certainly can't. Instantly the blue trinket goes on down. They're so worried. That's just the potential, how quick it could be. Pixel Bush is exactly where you love to see a Cassio Pierce set up and ready to go. The Baron, vision cleared. They're going to have a crack at it as we toggle vision again. I mean, look at it get eviscerated. Forever, once again, it was 20 HP the first time. Can he do it again? Can he do it again? Down at 1100. Oh, he's been turned! Look at the Baron! It's been held in place because the lands respite. I well don't believe played. it. What an interaction. Deny him of the kill and not fumble the bag. You can pick up the silver lining, which is the third dragon towards the soul point, which we may never see, but the Baron is Kangas. Very well done there from Mayfan. I mean, I know what Forever was thinking. I know what we were certainly Ooh. thinking here about the 20 HP that the Baron lived on last time, but Mayfan going to say, hey, I'm not going to give, give you the chance to 50-50. I'm going to make it invulnerable and it's just going to be a waste of your smite. So Mayfan really heads up, and he's been playing this game well the whole game through. Realistically, Kanga can make a big dent in the base of Vertex with this Baron. They certainly can. They use first Baron to square open the base in the bot lane, and now they're going to try and open up the top side of the map as well. Really keep Tomasino in check, and force the group up with the rest of his team. Up by 3,000 gold now is Kanga. More when the ornaments, as we've already mentioned, come into effect as well. And the Gargoyle Stoneplate here for Fido. He is going to be unleashed. Flash for flash. 
to try and find the engage. Supports look to get rowdy, but unable to move one of those crucial buffs off the map. It almost feels like Dante is the one playing the engage champion with the way he's moving around this map. Finds that W on towards Jake and ends up catalyzing the events that make him lose the flash, but ultimately Dante feels like a one-man army against the world here. Sure, Chirp has a bounty, but he's 0-4. and four. Dante is the one with the kills. There's Tomasino, he doesn't realize they can have a crack. He doesn't have flash. He does now. Lambs for Spy, I think he's just about to come on up. Does he even need to use it? Oh, he splashed across the water, break his ankles. He says, you're not going to catch me this time. That goes to the corner of the Forge God, knocks one up. It's Dante, the most important of them all. Lightning crash, the response, breath of life, and they need it. Kenga fighting for the life. Look at trying to end the game right here, right now. Dante? Get themselves that draw, get themselves that victory. Dante oh. burning to the poison of a Cassiopeia. We said that Fido would be scary, and Fido is dead. But have Vertex done enough to stop the siege? They've got still two major AD carry threats. And TP's up, Skimmy. Chirp might be going down. Rosie's jumped in. He's on his own. He's going to get knocked up, pushed around, and taken down as Mayfun is now 12 and 3. And between him as well as Voice, they run it straight towards the Nexus. That Lamb's respite couldn't have provided any more value. It looked like Dante and Chirp were going to just AoE damage oh. and take down Kanga, but it is going to be the boys on the blue side coming out, even equalizing the series off the back of a monster performance from Mayfarn here on this Kindred. Blue side once again proving to be too strong, and Exodia draft with the debuting of a brand new champion, Emilio. It went the distance, 32 minutes. They had its ups and they had its downs, and both Eddie carries happy tried dance. to prove how good they could be, but Jake's a very happy man. He's on the board, he proved just how strong this champion could be, and he promised we get a dance with a dog in a celebration that is fit for just that. Absolutely. The boys sharing smiles across the roster here. Mayfun on your screen right now, pairing up with Fido <laughs> to have... He looks <laughs> so stressed, doesn't he? After that game, I would be too, <laughs> especially with that ending, but it is Kanga, you know, getting uncharacteristically demolished by Vertex in game one, but equalizing off the back of Fido's Cassiopeia, which teams just have to stop giving him this pick. Yeah, it was a crazy game now. There was so much going on. I think we were really impressed with how strong Vertex were holding on. Like the fact that you can give away the champions they did. I mean, we finally see Lucian, Milio, obviously Cassiopeia being the ones that get through as well, like all in this first half. We were like, hey, maybe from draft, this could kind of be over, but the execution from both teams was very hit and miss. Uh, enjoyable to say the least, Poltron. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, our first game in the LC with Milio, right? First game's been let through. Mm -hmm. Was that the best game for it? Looked pretty good towards the end. Mayfun on the Kindred. Super fed with that Milio buffing him up. I think again, like you said, Vertex trying to hold on, right? Dante really trying to mech max every fight. Get back in there, help the team, stay alive, eat those shutdowns. This was uh, one of the plays I... Actually, it happened a lot of times. Oh, Mayfun had forth. so much confidence on the blue side. I don't know what was so different for him, but he was in the red side jungle over and over and over again, Poltron. Of course. Again, Kindred Vi. It is a good matchup for the Kindred. As long as you have prior lanes, you're finding her one-on-one. -on -one. Use your Kindred Q to dodge the Vi Q. Yeah, just looking at these replays getting lost in the source that is this game number two here. Um, <laughs> I just, even though I just saw a play out, it still is very shocking to see uh, how certain engagements went about. Dante on the Zeri though. <laughs> Max checking it over there. <laughs> that Q was just like criminal. What has what is, what is possessed him? And I, it worked a couple times this game. But he was just so confident from the get-go, like you said, Poltron. We need to stop dashing in when Lolus has hook and Vi has her queue up. I think, again, in that bot play, Voice just dashed in early, got insta-hooked, had to flash. I think the whole game could actually be just summed oh, up that, as criminal. Oh, that's the whole game, yeah. <laughs> Everything so was criminal. The, yeah, the, the positioning of certain champions, the skills and abilities that were used as well. I did like the objectives as well, what they were willing to take, what they weren't willing to give up as well. Yeah. Uh, Poltron was very admirable, this Baron being one oh, of this them. Was Baron was, again, I've got a lot of respect for Mayfan, like actually knowing the Kindred champ very well, <laughs> dropping the ultimate, making sure it's on the flip. If that was me playing the Kindred, I would have oh. probably not ulted, lost, lost the Baron, got flamed, you know? 
<laughs> Look, I was waiting for this screen because initially I was going to talk about the vibe build, but when we look at the damage, the gold difference, like this is exactly what we've talked about, how back and forth, how close everything was. But Kindred having 35.4k total damage there, absolutely just pumping it out left and right. That's a nuke. You don't even see that from most <laughs> AD characters, like most Jinx and Aphelios games, right? You look at how fed Dante was in this game. He only did 27k. Kindred did a whole nother 10 on top of that. So just speaks to Mayfun's ability to carry. And to do a bit of nap math, I mean, basically Kindred's done all of his team's damage combined. Uh, I know the math doesn't completely add up them, uh, Nat, so like, don't get too upset at me, but basically <laughs> has. Well, it's practically there. I mean, you could give or take, I think, about 3k, and yeah. you're pretty much on top of that one. So <laughs> very phenomenal. The vibe build, though, we do need to touch on Poltron because yeah. from minute, what, it's eight, I think you were just like, I don't I don't know what's I mean, when I saw <laughs> Vi with the Dirk and Double Longsword, I'm like, hey, if you're going to go after Shock, you're committing, okay, I'm just going to be a body, get the ultimate off, try and live, you know, create space, but you've gone Aftershock, you've built Umbral Glaive into, what was it, Even Trout, the second yeah. item? Odd build, right? I know Max was a big fan of it, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, for yeah. Vatum, congratulations on the worst buy build of the uh, LCO. Potentially ever. Uh, potentially yeah. even though we might even go as far as ever, but that's enough of that game number two. We're going to talk about this whole series as a whole uh, with some of the winners. I do know we have Jake on the line here. Jake, how's Pancake going? Did you enjoy the little dance? You've been practicing that one? Yes. You, you, the little little pee for puppers. A little TikTok if you've seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have. It was great. I loved seeing that celebration dance. Uh, it was a celebration though for a draw here. One one. With game one, what do you think was one of those issues? Did you feel like you were in contention to potentially win it? Or was it just a really tough one, the position you guys were in after lanes? I think there was a couple of bad trades in lane. And then even we're still fine after that. There was just a couple of mis mis executed team fights, I think. Um, and when you're playing a comp with like a, like a double 80 carry, Mm -hmm. um, it can kind of get out of control pretty fast, if you, as you saw, and it's just harder to retake vision and everything kind of just snowballs from there. You don't really have the engage, like when you're playing Braum, you don't have a Nautilus or a Khan to make as many picks. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, definitely a fine comp, but yeah, we were just a little bit roughed after falling behind. And what was the chat between game one and game two? Obviously we knew side selection had changed there, or like what side you guys were mm -hmm. playing on. Um, but was there anything else you really focused on, or do you try not to go too hard into it between games? Uh, I think I think emotions are, were a bit emotional. I think because obviously, as you know, as you're saying, you know, it's a draws good and all, but it's a pretty short season, so you definitely always want to take away the two points. Um, so I just kind of just told the guys at the end of the game, just chill out, take two minutes, take a breather. Um, and then we did. We came back and. Everyone kind of just wanted to get on like you know a bit more super comfort. Mm -hmm. So we saw um, Mayfan on the the Kindred just going absolutely crazy, and that's <laughs> his comfort. So yeah. Now Jake, obviously Mayfan looked superb on the Kindred, but Milio, first game was in the LCO, right? What are your thoughts on it? Do you think mm -hmm. Vertex should have banned it instead? Do you think that was the reason why you got that win? Oh, it definitely helps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just think the character like. If you get, you know, if like if you want to play towards it and you can be like, like a really aggressive lane, mm -hmm. um, you know, it definitely does a lot of damage. You know, you get the bonus range. But the thing that I think is probably undersold is, you know, AOE QSS, massive 20% yeah, range increase. Feel. So if you're playing these junglers like Kindred, you get the five, six marks, whatever it is for his range increase. You combine that and he's just got like a caitlin or a tristan like level 18 tristan yeah, there is never just going kindred. absolutely crazy it's like yeah you saw a couple of times you sped him up against the oriana it's like uh <laughs> what do i do I'm just, <laughs> there's no response of course well look jake uh, we do have to cut it short because we obviously have to talk to the other team as well but thank you so much for joining us and congrats even though it was a draw thanks guys see ya see, see ya, ya. Nice little insight on Melio, it being picked up one of the ones i wanted to ask him was if he thought it was going to get let through and then i was like hey we're going to get to talk to Vertex. We can just <laughs> ask them why they yeah. let it through. We can sort of talk about the opposite side of the coin there. But Kindred not realizing how impactful it was going to be paired with the Melio, but also being comfort. So you get a double whammy on, on one player right there. I mean, for sure. Like, again, unless you're playing to, or you have something prepped into the Melio, ban it. 
Yeah. It's OP, especially yeah. in Oath, especially in the LCA, right? We love team fighting. Emilio loves team fighting. You got to mm. buff up those hyper carries, such as what we went over earlier: Jinx, Aphelios, Zeri. Obviously, we saw the Lucian. Bit of a different pairing, still strong. Mm -hmm. Don't think it was the best uh, game for for Voice. Maybe he's had a rough one, but again, we had the Kindred. We had the hyper carry from Mayfun. Huge Emilio value. Did you guys like the Lucian, by the way, when you were seeing it play out? Were you really happy to see it and something fresh come into LCO? I was happy to see it. I don't think it was played to the best of its ability based on a variety of circumstances. Normally, you want to see that Lucian being hyper aggressive on mid waves, able to just dash in and get basically 100 to zeros in one second. Yep. That's what we didn't see this game, but that was because of the Kindred, right? And Milio's job in that game is to make sure Kindred's staying alive, like Jake mentioned, giving that range increase, making sure you're a QSS spot for that Kindred. And then Mayfun, we saw dealt 36,000 damage. So you're, you're kind of fine if your Lucian's not doing too much when your Kindred's pumping out that much. It was like, you know, this contingency plan. The backup could have been Lucian if Kindred had had a bit of a rougher game, but didn't. Had a phenomenal game number two there for them. Uh, speaking of Vertex, though, let's talk to Rosie. Let's have a bit of a chit-chat. Rosie! Rosie. Hello! No, How no. are you feeling uh, despite the um, draw? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, it could be better after that. I think uh, we definitely are a better team than Kanga and we should 2-0, but um, yeah, happens. Look, it was very entertaining from our point of view. We loved watching it. Um, this Milo is the biggest thing we have to ask. Why were you guys comfortable letting it through? Like, what uh, uh, What was happening there? Well, one, one we're, we're, we're comfortable with leaving it open. Um, our draft plan was different from how we ended up doing our picks. So I think we, we kind of messed up our own draft, but... Kind of with how all their picks went, it was we already knew exactly what they wanted to pick, so it was just a bit of a mess up on our end with what we picked in what order. Okay, so nothing after the melee caught you by surprise. You knew like the Lucian and the Cassio was probably going to be coming out as well. Yeah, like once once they had the melee, we kind of knew they wanted Cassio on two three once they were banning out Chirp's champions for it. Mm -hmm. So we kind of knew that like after melee was picked, that Cassio was going to be picked on two three, and they also had to go with their AD to pair with melee. So yeah. Rosie, mate, been a hot minute, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, me, back on the back on the Avalanche days. Where was this <laughs> level of draft prep when we played? You know, if we if we prepped this draft, we would have probably won that tournament way back when. Yeah, probably would have been <laughs> champ. That would have been fine, right? <laughs> anyway, congrats on the win, at least for the first game. But your nought, I loved the aggression. Is this something you've been prepping? You're like, hey, today I really want to play nought. How can we play to both games? Um. Honestly, not really. We kind of had prep for a bunch of champions. Nautilus just seemed like, um, God, I kind of forgot the first game draft. I think <laughs> even in like the history. first game, um, part of it was like we needed a, some sort of like a go button just so we can like get things going. Mm -hmm. So I think like always like me on something that I like I can just hit a button and just go like I'm not scared to just like flash in and get things started. <laughs> I mean, I did that kind of into it over a wall and then with the rest of the team <laughs> followed. But yeah, I think me, me on something that can snap engage is like really good for us. All I had. Okay, I do have one final question before uh, let you go. It was just in your mind, Rosie. Like, what happened in game two? Like, what was the deciding point for you that you were just like, "This is over," or did it never really felt that way until the very end? Um, it kind of didn't feel that way until like the end when Tomasino died top to the Kindred. I think it may, like he, he himself said he could beat the Kindred one v one, and I think he could have. He kind of was asleep at the wheel, honestly. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I think that there was still a really good opportunity that we win that game. I just think we couldn't really 5v5 them at that point because of how strong they were, but we had the Camille in the side lane. So as long as like one of their strong members like Kindred was up there that we could actually win like a 4v4 or if like, even if Tomasino could kill a 1v1, then we have a really good shot. Yeah, look, it was great to watch. And again, congratulations on the draw. And thank you so much for joining us, Rosie. Thank you. See ya. See ya. It's unfortunate because I wanted to see it from their point of view. Like maybe when you're in the game, when you don't see the same stats that we're seeing, when you're seeing the same like, everything else that overarching picture maybe it might feel a little bit more over for them but it's nice that even in their mind it was never over right until that end i think you raised a really good point though about the sort of thomasina situation because he definitely could take mm. out the kindred and i think you saw that panic flash or maybe a, a preemptive flash sort of in, expecting the enabled um q2 charge from the camille that that was going to be enough to try and take him down so remove that threat suddenly the side lane pressure with the whole breaker camille is no longer there so then you're thinking ah i think the game plan's starting to fall away but there was definitely a part of us that's like oh we're ramping up here like you know Frozen's gonna keep jumping into the pit to try and steal away these objectives buy them crucial seconds buy them time to 
uh, allowed us Camille to come into effect. So um, I think both teams may be feeling a little bit disheartened, but a fair result ultimately. And to that point of the game not being over, it certainly wasn't, right? Despite the kill score and what it felt like, yeah. the gold lead was quite even throughout yeah. the majority of that game, right? Mm -hmm. Even Chirp yeah. on that Oriana, who didn't have the greatest early game, was down a couple kills and deaths, was still in there in terms of gold, sitting on that death cap. And then obviously Dante having the nuclear performance on that Zeri, I think had like seven kills or something sitting on that three completed items. So there definitely were windows for Vertex to get back into that game and ultimately just did come down to a matter of execution. Mm -hmm. And we've listed a lot of players that have really stuck out for us in that game too. There were even more in game one, but I want to know who our DARE MVP is because a lot of people had very individual amazing performance in both game one and two. I think Dante, I think in game one was the massive reason why they won it. And I think yeah. in game two, very hard to look good when you're losing in a, in a situation like that, but was baiting, was really trying to be the, the driving force. I think we mentioned a few times during the cast, like he was almost like engaging um, as a Zeri to say, come at me boys. And like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll go for the Zeri. Hang on a minute. I've got like four boys here to back me up. So I think really for the consistency between both games, I'd give it to Dante. Yeah. You, Straight up, couldn't have said it better myself. Don't want to disagree. Well, as a jungle player myself, <laughs> I would, you know, make fun of the great Kindred game. Kindred is one of my favorite champions. And, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a bit of a mix for me, right? Dante is my guy. He played very well both games. I think made fun in his first game wasn't his best performance, but second game, he brought it back. All but right, again, we'll, we'll let the Twitch chat vote. Of course, it is not in our hands to decide who the Dare MVP is. And you guys went for the made fun mayhem. He went for it. Wasn't going to be the Dante diff for that MVP there, so... Hey, Mayfa, I want to say it, in game two, and maybe it's a recency bias, maybe we've all already forgotten what happened in game one, but man, in game two, he was playing disrespectful in the absolute best way possible. He went one and eight the first game, I think. Oh, we can forget about well, the so first like game. Well, so like I said, so like I said, everyone one, right? forgot about everybody. game one, and it was a recency bias. Yep. <laughs> That yeah. damage alone is enough, in my opinion, to give him that MVP. Sure. It's like an average, you know? Even yeah. though even though it was down here for game one, it was up here for game two, we average it above everyone else. Well, that's what's crazy. He had a 33% damage share despite playing Vi in the first game. Yeah. Right? Like, on when you're playing Vi, you're doing that's maybe like 10% of your team's damage. Yeah, that, that shouldn't be that high. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So a very well-deserved dare MVP, as we say. But for now, we're going to jump to a break. When we come back, we're going to have some fun with our menu log meal time. With being used too much on hit damage to complement the blight stacks. The second dragon comes to life. Quarter of the Forge God goes out, knocks up three members. Rose is in focus right now, but Fane is on to Mayfine, who falls on down. Dante picks up that next one. Into the back line goes Thomasina. Look to try and knock them down with all out mode. He's going to die and give Fido a fifth, but it doesn't matter because Fido died in the end. Very unfortunate for them, but it was nice to see. Revis here. Yeah, on the Ray right now, as is Rosie. If they can make a play happen right now, this would be disastrous for him. Jakey's going to rock up, say, here, have a shield. Is that enough? A flash away, but Forever's on the hunt, on the prowl, wanting to kill. Summoner Hill comes up, Forever's been denied! And they thought they had to jump, but Illusion gets first blood. That's a bit... matter of time until we see any competitive. Forced away very early here by Mayfun. Jumping back into the pit. Are they going to make this a 50 50? I dare believe it. As they Go jump in with Tomasino, they found Jake. The banish down at 2600, getting closer and closer to the smite range right now. 2k, 20, oh. 20 HP. It was so close forever. I commend you for the attempt. Probably not going to happen. It 20 HP the first time. Can he do it again? Can he do it again? Down at 1100. Oh, he's been done. Look at the Baron. It's been held in place because the land's respite. I well don't believe played. it. What an interaction. Oh. 